order and request that I rule um, on some language that's used. And the first thing I'll say is, uh, honorable member, it should have been brought up immediately following question period, the first, first thing. The second thing I'll say is, was the first day. <laughs> We're going to give everyone a little bit of leeway here. Um, I will say that um, uh, there's no one loves the heated debate more than myself, and I'm sure we'll have lots of them in the legislature, but I will just ask everyone to please use words and language that is suitable for this place that we are in and respectful for this place and worthy of this place. And that's all I'm going to say on this. Um, I ask the honorable members to remember the process that they need to take in order to call a point of order or a point of privilege, and also that we all uh, remember where we are. So thank you very much. Okay, matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Oh, well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I think your direction today is wise, and I think it was probably precipitated by a word I used in here, Madam Speaker, so just let me say I withdraw the remark, and it's not my intention to be anything but productive in this <laughs> legislature, so thank you for your wise counsel. Uh, today is uh, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. Uh, I note that this year's theme is Together Always United in Diversity. Uh, Prince Edward Island is becoming such a wonderful, diverse uh, province. Uh, and it's also always important, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, that we make sure that Islanders deserve to be respected uh, for who they are, regardless of who they love and what they wear. Uh, this is a place where individuals should be fully respected, and I know that's the case in this legislature. I was very impressed, uh, Madam Speaker, with a, a great story about the community of Tignish, uh, where a group of uh, community-minded people came together and installed a very impressive welcome and thanks for visiting sign uh, over, the, over the street entering into the community of Tignish. Uh, nothing surprised me about Tignish. I've never seen a community, although we have so many in PEI, but who can come together so quickly and, and be so uh, uh, supportive of one another. Uh, special recognition to Faye LeClaire Patterson, who kind of uh, uh, spearheaded the event, but also individuals like Doug Martin, Chris Cadet, mm -hmm. and Harley Perry, and so many others who participated in this, and no doubt being the community-minded individual he is, the MLA from the area was probably involved somewhere along the way, or will find a way to take a little credit in a pamphlet somewhere along the way, <laughs> Madam Speaker, and rightfully so, and rightfully so. I did have the opportunity to speak this morning in the uh, basement of the Shaw Building to Dr. Heather Morrison as we both arrived for work right around the same time. She was telling me what a great honour it was to be recognised with an honorary degree uh, from the University of Prince Edward Island and uh, how uh, humbling it was to be part of the convocation uh, exercises at uh, UPEI. And I was remiss yesterday in the opening uh, not recognising Dr. Morrison, but also Dr. Uh, Gaynor Watson Creed, Dr. Kathy Martin, and my good friend John Harrell, who was recognized today for very deserving individuals uh, of their honorary degree at the University of Prince Edward Island. <clears throat> uh, the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture and myself will be taking part in an event following question period today, Madam Speaker, uh, at the Charlottetown Airport as we welcome the arrival of the first flight of Porter on their direct flight uh, from Ottawa to Charlottetown. Uh, it's an exciting day. Uh, increasing the connectivity for our region uh, has been a challenge for us uh, post-pandemic, but this is an important first step that a lot of hard work went into by the Charlottetown Airport Authority and by members of, uh, of the government to make this happen. Uh, we'll be uh, receiving the Executive Chair, Robert uh, DeLucci, Ms. Uh, Madam Speaker, I did have an opportunity to meet Mr. DeLucci when I was in Toronto last week, and he told me that uh, uh, this initially started as one direct flight from Ottawa to Charlottetown daily, and the uptake has been so strong that it's already moved to two a day, so that's a really positive sign, uh, and that's an exciting step forward for us, for our tourism sector, for our business sector as well. And part of our community strength as a province in the region. So uh, I want to thank all of those who were involved. I want to thank the minister and his staff uh, for putting in the hard work, and also to Doug Newson and the wonderful people at Charlton Airport Authority uh, who've done a great job under very difficult circumstances over the last couple of years to build back uh, our, our flight schedule at Charlton. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and enjoy the proceedings today. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I want to welcome all those who are watching online or from the comfort of their homes uh, today. Um, welcome to today's proceedings, all of, so to those who are in the gallery today. Uh, 
Susan Hartley, we have Rachel Drummond, Norma Dingwall, and Toby McDonald. Welcome. Um, I also want to congratulate all those who uh, received their uh, degrees this morning from UPEI with the um, business and uh, engineering students, and also congratulate John Harold uh, for his honorary degree, and uh, he received that for his great work that he did with the uh, vulnerable uh, persons of, or people of Prince Edward Island. So it was well deserved um, and congrats to all. Um, today is another day of uh, bringing awareness and education to Family Violence Prevention Week. Um, a member from Charlottetown West Royalty participated in the walk here in Charlottetown today. Um, so uh, I encourage everyone to check all the events that may be in their area and if they can't make one in their own area, Travel to another. This is to show that your uh, your support, so that we can bring an end to uh, to family violence uh, here in Prince Edward Island. The Premier mentioned the sign and take nation. Yes, that is something that's been oh for four years. I think the discussion started with that, and it was Alway's idea. Alway is. Um, his partner, uh, Faye, Faye LeClaire, is from Tignish originally, and they, they summer here. Um, so he wanted to do something to, to give back to the community uh, and kind of uh, a present uh, for Faye. So his idea was uh, to do a sign welcoming those into Tignish. It's a pretty big structure. Um, I can't remember the overall height. It's 24, 25 feet, and I think it's like 70-some feet in, 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 in width. So he donated basically the materials and the, and the monies for that. Um, but it was local community businesses that uh, showed their support, and they came on board without any hesitation, as does uh, the town of Tignish uh, has done historically in the past. Um, they'll roll up the sleeves and they'll get the work done themselves. Um, so uh, again, thanks to those, uh, Harley Perry, Perry's Construction, Chad Goody, Goody uh, Goody's Electrical, to Dougie Martin from uh, Martin's Machine Shop, and, and anyone else that was involved. They say there was no taxpayers' dollars, and that is very true. There's no taxpayers' dollars, or, or whether it be provincial, federal, or municipal, uh, put into this. Um, however, there was cooperation from, um, uh, or, or support from the town of Tignish, obviously, and support from the Department of Transportation, um, who also had to do a lot of work just to, in order to make sure that it met the regulations and, and that. So I do have to. Uh, thank the Department of Transportation for all the work that they did to help um, the community or the town of Tignish and those involved to get this project done. And uh, you're all welcome to come to Tignish and see us. Yeah. Come in the daytime, see it in the daytime, spend some money, wait for the evening to go back when, you, when it's lit up. So it's really nice to see. So, um, so with that, Madam Speaker, I just want to, um, to also say thank you to all of those uh, Healthcare working staff, uh, nurses, the doctors, or any frontline worker, anybody that's involved, uh, to residents right across the island who have contacted our office in the last uh, two days um, regarding some of the questions we asked in here yesterday. Um, I thank them for their input, and I would uh, appreciate any more um, any more calls that they have because what we are as official opposition, their voice. And I appreciate that they are actually reaching out to us. So, thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome everybody back uh, to the Legislature today. Some I've already seen, of course, this morning and or early this afternoon, rather, when we participated in the walk in silence um, for, for this uh, Family Violence Week that we are commemorating. And that's a good point to welcome all of the members of the gallery today. I see Susan Hartley, Norma Dingwall, Toby McDonald, and I don't know Rachel Drummond, but welcome to you. And I know that for at least three of the folks in the gallery work um, reducing violence and eradicating violence uh, against women in our communities has been part of their lifelong work. And it's lovely to see you here today and uh, welcome to you all. It's also, of course, International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia, work that we all um, have to continue doing, of course, uh, in this province, as we have unfortunately repeated examples of uh, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia being displayed in our communities to this day. So it's up to all of us, every single one of us, to make sure that we stand up strong and loud against that continuously and consistently. 
The PEI Writers Guild announced today its short list for the PEI Island Literary, Literary Awards. And of course, we have a long and storied history here on Prince Edward Island, excuse that, um, of, of writing, um, excellence in writing, both fiction and nonfiction. And I was really interested reading through the short list of names for all of the awards. It, it goes right back to early elementary writing awards. Um, a junior high writing awards, and, and that sort of encouragement at a very young age to be creative and to sit down and put pen to paper or fingers to keyboards or whatever is done these days when you write. Um, I think in, in instilling that and the value of that and recognizing it with awards at an early age is just such an important part of keeping that tradition going here on Prince Edward Island. And uh, I, I want to congratulate everybody who's shortlisted. I think the award ceremony is in the Trailside, Caf uh, Trailside Cafe on um, June the 11th, I believe. So I look forward to attending that. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. General Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to welcome everybody here to the gallery and those following along at home, particularly my mother. Um, I'm just going to be quick here today, Madam Speaker, but this morning I had the opportunity to attend, <laughs> thank you, the, the graduation ceremony at, at UPEI, and I know a couple of members of this house were, were perched up on stage. Uh, I was watching you from afar, but I, I was there as an invited guest, and I was quite proud to be there today because Brandon Curran, who is, has worked for me for a number of years, walked across the stage. So, yeah, yeah thank you. So, I want to congratulate Brendan because when he went back to do his fourth year, he was not only working full time for me, but he had just become a new, a new father. So I know the challenges that he, uh, he would have had to face to get all of his work done to walk across that stage. So uh, as somebody who knows him very well and works close with him, I'm really proud and he should be proud of himself. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to rise today to recognize a loyal member of the legislative TV audience. This lady is also a former employee of the QEH, so it's re relevant to me, Madam Speaker. Her name is Ann Connolly, and Ann is my wife's grandmother, who still lives independently at the age of 96. I enjoy my games of crib with Ann, but I can tell you she does not like the overuse of Madam or Mr. Speaker. <laughs> here, in the here in the legislature, I will have to add a few more into my statement just for her. Madam Speaker, Anne also has a great sense of humor. When she was invite, uh, visited by the honorable member from Charlottetown Winslow during the campaign, she said to him, I'm too old to vote, but I'll say a prayer for you. <laughs> I'm pleased to say that the prayer worked, Madam Speaker, and in my new role, I asked her to pray for me too. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The honorable member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I rise this morning to say hello to everyone tuning in from Charlottetown Victoria Park, all over the island, my colleagues and to our friends in the gallery, thank you for being here today. And uh, as was mentioned, I had the honour of attending the, the silent walk this morning for Family Violence Prevention Week and I very much, as I said yesterday, look forward to having family violence in our, in our rear view mirror. It's not impossible, it takes rolling up our sleeves, funding organisations and, um, and the political will to do so. And also, as was mentioned, today is the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. And I'm reminded of actions from this government that got us uninvited from the Pride Parade. And when we are slapped in the face like that, it's up to us to do the work to make sure that we get invited back to the Pride Parade because that is shameful and embarrassing and, and we should never have lost our place there, so let's work hard to get it back. In a time where the world is so full of hatred and fear and ignorance, this is our chance to spread love and unity. Our children depend on that now more than they ever did. This world is very different from the world that we grew up in. So if we get defensive or offended when we hear about transphobia, biphobia, um, or, uh, or homophobia, we need to think about that. Why are we getting defensive? And are we the people spreading love and unity? Or are we the, sp the people spreading hatred, fear, and ignorance? Because our children need us to be the ones spreading love and unity. So a challenge to everyone in here today, a challenge to everyone watching, a challenge to everyone. Let's ensure that we're spreading love and unity and that we are learning and we are open and we are accepting. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a, certainly a pleasure to rise today and welcome back to all my colleagues. 
Hello to everyone tuning in from District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park, the best district on PEI. <laughs> and uh, hello to everyone. <laughs> and uh, hello to those joining us in the gallery. Uh, firstly, I do want to thank all those who participated in today's Walk of Silence. It's always such a, a moving um, and significant event for Family Violence Prevention Week. And I am delighted to see uh, so much purple in, uh, in the crowd here today. Um, Madam Speaker, I'd also like to welcome the over 500 school administrators and principals that are here in Charlottetown this week uh, for the Canada Association of Principals Conference. I had the opportunity to speak at the conference this morning and uh, we actually have 80 Islanders participating in this event, so it was a, it's an amazing opportunity for our island principals to network and work, learn alongside colleagues from across the country. And Madam Speaker, on a last note, um, women have always played a huge role in our families and our communities. Uh, as Minister responsible for the status of women, I want to recognize the many talented women in this house. Congratulations on your recent elections, uh, and thank you for stepping forward for these important roles. I'd also like to congratulate the Honourable 69th Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, uh, the first name speaker named, uh, woman speaker named in the leg PEI Legislature was the Honourable Marion Reed, and that was back in 1984. Uh, since that time, there have only been five other women to sit in that seat. Uh, it is a position of authority and of leadership, and I'm thrilled to have a strong woman presiding over our provincial legislature. So congratulations once again, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Royalty are watching today, and um, you know, I just want to start off by, by saying hello to Susan, Norma, and Toby here today, and and, and a special uh, shout out to Rachel Drummond for coming today, and, and it's great to, to call you a friend, and, and appreciate you being here. Um, I just want to draw attention to the uh, to the important Family Violence Prevention Week um, is very important, and one of those uh, one of those uh, uh, community organizations that does a lot of work. They were on CBC this morning. Is Blooming House. Um, they do a lot of a lot of great work. If anybody heard the article uh, this morning, it was it was pretty important, and it shows that we do have some work to do um, there to support them and, and and improve that system. And I'd also want to say again, the member from Shelton Victoria Park, um, I accept your challenge. I accept your challenge. Um, she talked about love and unity and accepting that challenge because it is International uh, Day of, of Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia today. And it's an opportunity to, to reaffirm what we're doing and, and where we're going as a province. And equity becomes very important. So um, allyship learning and listening is, is incredibly important. And, and uh, I look forward to, to, to working together. So uh, I just wanted to stand and rise and say that. Thank you, Mr. Member from Resco Emeralds. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I, I first of all wanted to welcome everyone to the gallery, especially my constituent, Rachel Drummond. It's great to see you here today, looking dashing in purple as well. Well done. And uh, I, I wanted to just say uh, uh, a happy season. I haven't done this yet to all the, the fishers and farmers across, across the island, but especially in District 18, Rustico Emerald. And speaking of which, um, I was at the convocation this morning at UPEI, and one of my constituents, Bradley Campbell, who happens to be a fisher, he ran the Stanley Bridge Marina as well, but is fishing out of Cove Head this year, um, got his business degree. So congratulations to him. Of course, congratulations to Brendan Curran. And uh, I got to sit beside uh, John Herelt, who is, a, who is really a giant in so many ways and so many things he does for the island. So that was amazing as he's got his honorary degree. But uh, Madame, Madam Speaker, Ella Doucette, my constituent, um, who got her business degree, was bestowed with the Michael F. Cassidy Business Life Award, granted to the graduating um, Bachelor of Business Administration student with the highest aggregate average in the last 20 three semester hour courses. So that is a, a huge honor. Ella is a, is a great individual and she, she imported a lot of great ideas to me on the campaign trail. Hopefully I can bring some of them up in my response to the speech from the throne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is my first time speaking in the House. And Thank you. It's uh, an honour and a privilege to be standing here amongst my colleagues today. I'd like to take an opportunity to say a big hello to anyone in beautiful District 1 that might be watching today. I am thinking my wife might be uh, watching from her desk at work. I hope her boss is uh, 
don't hear this. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry if they do. Uh, I'm very honoured to be representing you all as uh, your MLA. A fun fact that I'm proud of in this district, uh, of District 1, uh, we experienced the highest voter turnout in this provincial election. So thank you to all those who took part in the democratic process and for putting your trust in our Premier, our PC government and myself as your representative. Madam Speaker, while I'm on my feet today, I would like to send a shout out to a very special family in my district, the Hiber family of New Zealand. They recently auditioned for Family Feud Canada. The Hiber family consists of their matriarch Mary and the late Raymond Hiber. They have a large family consisting of 12 children, 26 grandchildren, and 16 great-grandchildren. I have no doubt this hard-working, community-minded, and fun-loving family will represent our district and Prince Edward Island very well, so best of luck. In closing, I would like to send well wishes to David Stewart of South Lake. He is a fire captain, a mechanic, a husband, a father, a son, a true fighter, and an all-around great guy. I've been told that he has received exceptional care while in hospital and especially during his stay in ICU at QEH. We are so glad to hear you are on the road to recovery, David. Take care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think we're finished with that. We'll go on to uh, <laughs> statements by members, starting with the member from Surrey Elmira. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as it was mentioned yesterday, this week marks National Police Week. It is an opportunity for the country to acknowledge the contributions of our police forces across Canada. On Prince Edward Island, we are protected by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, along with the Charlottetown and Summerside City Police, the Kensington Police Service, and the Atlantic Police Academy. I have had the pleasure of working alongside many of these incredible officers over the past decade or more. We are so fortunate as they not only keep us safe 24 hours a day, but also give back to their communities through volunteering, coaching, mentoring in our island schools, and taking part in charitable events across the province. Madam Speaker, this year marks the 150th anniversary of the RCMP in Canada and 91 years of serving the province of Prince Edward Island. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of our government and all Islanders and wish all of our police officers a safe and happy National Police Week. We appreciate your dedication and the sacrifices you make every day to keep our province safe. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to be attending the City of Summerside Annual Community Awards Gala this evening where they will uh, give out six awards to some outstanding recipients. Uh, for close to three decades, the City of Summerside has had to uh, recognize their outstanding citizens and accomplishments with their neighbours through this awards gala. Uh, while I was a member on council, I enjoyed taking part in it, so it's going to be nice to go back to it tonight along with a fellow minister from Summerside who's going to be there as well. Uh, at the awards tonight, they're going to be giving out the Dave Logie Award for the Volunteer of the Year Award going to Susan Stephen Durash, the George Key Senior Memorial Award, which is for Citizen of the Year, and it'll be going to Jolene Clo. Uh, the Francis O. Perry Memorial Award, which will go to the late Carrie Wynn McLeod for a non-resident and good neighbor. Uh, the Mayor's Medal of Honor will be going out to James McHattie. And also, they'll be giving out the Youth of the Year Award, which will be going out to a District 21 resident, Olivia McNeil, who is also a page here in legislature with us. So on that note of awards, I'd also like to uh, mention that the uh, Summerside Western Capitals uh, team in Summerside has an uh, award presented to one of their players this week from the Canadian Junior Hockey League. He was named Defenseman of the Year, and that's Ed McNeil. And one last one that I wanted to touch on was Katie Grace Noy, who's a Summerside resident who is going to be representing Canada for the field hockey this year. Thank you. The Honourable Member 
from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, great things are happening around our communities and our province in this time of year. The weather is shining brightly and people are getting outside and it's exciting to get chatting with the people in District 11. Um, it's important for community connection and po positive mindset. Madam Speaker, this is a great opportunity to give a shout out to the classes around the province who spent time learning about the importance of an election and having a voice um, in what happens on PEI. I'd like to give a special shout out to 5D at Elliott River School for their unwavering support and many cheers from the sidelines throughout the election. Madam Speaker, I also want to give a shout out to a special fundraising fund effort by our school community um, and that I had a great fortune to be a part of. Um, I share my overwhelming excitement with the member for District 16 for this one. This year, Elliott River had not only one student represent the Easter Seals, but two. Megan and Caitlin Rogerson were this year's Easter Seals ambassadors. And so began the fundraising efforts of the Easter Seals tour. The challenge was put out to our staff to increase what was raised from the previous Easter Seals ambassador. The Elliott River staff organized events such as sales of candy kebabs, baked goods, recyclables, student teacher hockey game, lunch, dances, photo booths, hot dogs, popcorn, raffles, just to mention a few. And our, the community supported each and every one of these efforts. In true Elliott River style, this community raised a grand total of $25,128.70. My heart is filled with pride to have been part of such a, an effort support for the Easter Seals tour. In the words of an Elliott River hound, it was bark fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Next we'll go to question, question period and we'll take any questions as notice. Do you have any answers? Okay, Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So yesterday we watched an entire question period unfold in which the Minister of Health and his cabinet colleagues were very visibly uncomfortable answering um, or not answering. Uh, so a question, and there were questions about the decision to close the ICU at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside. Madam Speaker, Islanders are terrified. There has been zero information provided by this government on this decision and there is no plan to reopen the ICU. Just yesterday we had two doctors and three nurses reach out to us expressing frustration and on this decision and raising even more questions about the impacts that this rash decision will have on our healthcare system. Question to the Minister of Health. How many patients have, have already been transferred to the QEH as a result of this closure of the Prince County Hospital's ICU? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, for the question. Uh, obviously, um, I want to be accurate in, in my answer, but I believe the number is three. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Honourable Member, or uh, Leader of the Opposition, sorry. Madam Speaker, um, I think the Minister needs to have either better communication with whomever is telling him this because I think the number may be closer to six or seven. So, um, you know, that's a large number of patients that have been transferred over to uh, QEH that's already put uh, impacting uh, the ICU there that was already uh, overworked, so this minister should know those answers. And he should have been informed. So I'm going to ask the minister, were you not informed by, by Health PEI about how many patients will be transferred, or did you not even bother to answer the question, or to ask that question and just answer with three today? I'm the Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I think again it's important to understand why we were transferring the, these patients. It's to show that they get the appropriate care that they that they need at that facility. Obviously, we have staffing challenges at the Prince County Hospital, which prohibits us from giving these uh, people the care that they may require. So again, in the interest of patient safety, they are now uh, being cared for by our professionals at the QEH. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe of the opposition. Madam Speaker, and of course, that, that had no that was no answer to the question that I had. I mean, there needs to be communication. That's what we're failing to see here today and yesterday is that there's a communication failure between Health PEI 
and the health minister, or this government. So, Madam Speaker, we all know this decision was made in the cover of darkness, with zero consultation between the government and health PI and the frontline staff of patients who would negatively be affected. So, question to the minister: Why is it clear that you didn't see it necessary to brief QEI, QEH staff or affected patients about this immediate changes? Can you tell me when you made your when you made your cabinet and caucus colleagues from Summerside and West Prince aware of the decision to close the ICU? at the Prince County Hospital. Hello, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. And I apologize for some of the re re uh, repetitive answers that I may give today. But again, um, this situation became upon us fast. Uh, we didn't have co coverage in that unit. So again, we were briefed by uh, Health PE, I believe, on Wednesday, advised uh, our members uh, from that area on Thursday as a consideration. Again, back to increased communication. I do believe that's important. Um, and then again, they had to go forward. Again, we did lose some coverage. It's unfortunate. Uh, it came upon us fast, and we had to make a decision. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So finally, we have an, an answer. Um, but yesterday, we weren't getting those answers. We asked this question several times. We weren't getting those answers. But today, miraculously, the answer appeared, I guess. So, um, but I don't understand why staff, patients, and islanders um, were not told about this. You know, so, so question to the Minister of Economic Development, um, member, and who is also a member who represents Ms. Scush, Evangeline, or Evangeline Ms. Scush. Can you tell the House when you were briefed of the decision close, uh, was closing the ICU at the Prince County Hospital that virtually all of your residents would rely on, and what did you tell your constituents? He was involved in that meeting as well. Obviously, again, it is consideration. It is important. Um, again, it, the, the decision, the, or I wouldn't even call it a decision. The option that we had to make um, was made um, last week, and we had to inform as many people as we can. We did wait till the final hour to try to find a solution to this problem. Again, locum coverage, we were working right till the last minute and we'll continue to work on covering that ICU as best we can. But again, in the interest of patient safety, we had to make a difficult decision that nobody wants to make and we did make it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So again, I'm gonna ask this question because it was specifically pointed to the Minister of Economic Development who also represents Evangeline Muskush. Mm. Can you tell the House what you were briefed on? He, the Minister of Health said it was Thursday, what you were briefed on, and you represent an area where they would rely on the ICU in Summerside, so it's very important to them. Yeah, what did you tell your constituents prior to the announcement? Honourable Premier. Yes. Madam Speaker, um, I think it's important for members of this legislature to realize how, and I think one of the longest standing members should understand how this works, that each minister would be responsible to answer questions about their individual departments. Uh, questions around health would be answered by the Minister of Health or by myself as Premier, uh, and it wouldn't be something that we would do on a constituency basis where we would ask people in here. I think the Honourable Member knows that. The Honourable uh, Minister of Health and Wellness has explained the process uh, ad nauseum. Um, nobody wanted to do this. I think the opposition is trying to paint this as government did some kind of nefarious deal and tried to hide it from anyone, which is exactly, exactly, exactly untrue. Uh, and they're trying to paint this as some kind of political uh, move, Madam Speaker, and it, someone who has been around politics and has watched politics for 35, almost 40 years, I'm trying hard to understand what political advantage it would be for any government to want to do this, Madam Speaker, but uh, I, don't, I don't understand why we're going down this road. Here. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I'll tell you why I asked those questions. Each one of us were elected to represent our constituents. So we all have a district in Prince Edward Island that we represent. We were voted in to be their voice in this house. We're, we represent, we are the communication between whatever decisions are made in here and our constituents. So therefore, I'm going to ask the question again to the, to the Minister of Economic Development and the Minister responsible for Evangeline Muskush. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to your constituents prior to the announcement of the IC, ICU closure in Summerside to let them aware of the change? Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, I 
Chair, I'm seeing again that I do understand the political process and how we're all elected individually by district, but there's not anything in this legislature during question period that allows constituents to ask members of other or, or other constituents uh, their opinions or views. Uh, the ministers are sworn in and they take an oath uh, to be part of executive council and their job is to uh, talk about and defend the individual uh, departmental issues that they're responsible for and that is what they do and we don't get into this house where we ask individual members what they think of individual decisions that might impact uh, their uh, their individual districts. As a member of executive council your job first and foremost is to try to do the best you can uh, representing the executive branch of government. That's what we all do. That's the oath we swear. Uh, I think the Honourable Leader of the Opposition at one point in his career swore that oath and he should know that, Madam Speaker. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm going to go back to what I said again. When you get in the Cabinet, you don't, you don't forget about the people that put you in that position. All right? So there is an onus uh, as a representative of your district to make sure that the people that you represent, the communities that you represent, are well represented and well aware of any changes that impact that district. This is a huge, huge decision made by this government and Health PEI to close ICU in Summerside, to close, yeah. uh, uh, to put lives at risk yeah. in Western Prince Edward Island. So I think that would be the first thing that would be on my mind, regardless of what position I am, I'm in. Put politics aside, put the health of Prince Edward Islanders first. So I'm going to ask this question to the Minister of Social Development, who represents Summerside, who is the minister responsible for Summerside. So the minister responsible for Summerside. When were you informed of this decision to close the Prince County ICU, and which is in your own backyard, and how did you break the news to your residents and your constituents that the ICU at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside was closed? The Honourable Premier. Again, Madam Speaker, I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition, I, I'm trying to understand uh, why he's going down a political road. I, I, I'm, I'm, I've been familiar with this strategy for four years, uh, and, and I, I, as much as I want to question it, I have to respect uh, the individual uh, questions that come across uh, the floor. But again, uh, the job of a member of executive council, and you swear an oath to uh, to do the business uh, of the executive branch of government, uh, you're responsible for your individual departments. If you have a question uh, that you need to ask about economic development, you should ask that about economic development. But anything under the purview of health and wellness would be directed to the Minister of Health, or in some circumstances such as now, the Premier. I think the Honourable Member knows that. Uh, we all are here to, look, to do the best we can for our individual uh, constituents, that's how our electoral system works, but when you swear an oath to executive council, your first job, Madam Speaker, is to make sure the executive branch of government works for all islanders. That's what we're doing in this case, Madam Speaker. A member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It will come as no surprise that I'll pick up where my colleague left off. My first question is to the Minister of Health. Um, throughout this ICU closure, you and Health PEI have stated that you feel comfortable, which you just did today, about the QEH's capacity to handle the influx of patients they'll be receiving a result of your decision to shut down the ICU in Prince County. Can you confirm that there is already a quest out for additional nurses to help deal with the overcrowding that this closure has caused at the QEH? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I think the point here is uh, this was not a decision that we made. We did not have a choice between A or B. It was simply A in order to maintain the safety of, of uh, our patients. So again, we have one ICU. We have to work with uh, all of our health care providers to staff it appropriately. I agree with the premise of the questions. It's, it's important that we, you know, we provide safe care to those people that are there, but we cannot currently at this time staff the Prince County ICU the way we want to so we have not a lot of choice in order to maintain the ICU coverage at QEH. Thank you Madam Speaker. I remember from Charlottetown West Royalty. Why weren't these plans done before? 
It seems strange that the minister is able to answer the question. The minister is so out of touch with staffing needs of the QEH as he doesn't know how to, to answer this question effectively. Why are you unable to admit the decision to close the ICU at Prince County Health School has further eroded the QEH's ability to effectively manage the needs of patients? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We will continue to monitor the work um, that Health PEI and, and the QEH is doing to maintain the services that we do have. It, obviously, they're their operational arm of our health system, so we do trust in their decisions. And again, we have some professionals there um, that will take care of our patients, so that's, all, that's what we can do, and we will continue to do that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty. You, you, you're, not, you're not ready for this. The QEH is not ready for this. Um, the minister is full of excuses and full of denial, all while his former West, West Prince are visibly uncomfortable, his colleagues in here are visibly uncomfortable with his inability to, pr to provide clear answers. <laughs> Question, <laughs> well, <laughs> he's not feeling very comfortable. <clears throat> Question to the minister about two and a half years is a long time. Did you know, did, the, did, did your government know that, that internal medicine physicians had planned to leave their practice since 2020? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the premise of the question if somebody was planning on two years ago to, to leave our system. Again, we talk to our physicians all the time. We try to accommodate as best we can under these tough conditions. So, again, I, I, I don't understand the, the premise of the question that they were thinking about leaving for two years. We continue to talk to our physicians. We continue to support them, and that's what we do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Charlton, West World. You don't just shut down an ICU over a Mother's Day weekend. Okay, you knew these doctors were leaving. They, they had said that they were leaving. Madam Speaker, the minister doesn't have to take my word for this fact. This information was provided directly to me from a nurse who worked at the ICU in Prince County Hospital. And they took offense to, with, with, with your wording of, a few patients would be transferred. Question to the Minister of Health. Are you suggesting that all of the healthcare workers who are expressing frustration and fear over this decision to close the ICU are blowing it out of proportion? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, absolutely not. Um, we understand the position we're placing our healthcare workers in. We've, they've been in that position through COVID and they performed uh, extraordinarily well for us. It's another challenge that they've risen to. Again, we appreciate what they've done for us in our system. We don't take them for granted. Uh, I have lots of family and friends that are healthcare workers, so I understand the challenges that they've had. This is a, a significant one. I acknowledge that. Um, and, you know, we do rely on them to provide the best health care that they can to Islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. These answers just aren't good enough. You talk about appropriate care a few questions ago. Madam Speaker, on one hand, the minister is trying to tell us that he's respecting the opinion of nurses and doctors, and the, on the other hand, he's ignoring their concerns and please, please for help. That's what we're getting on this side of the house. They're, they're, they're asking you to take this seriously. Question to the Minister of Health. How much longer can our frontline staff expect you to ignore their concerns while simultaneously pre uh, pretending that everything is fine in our hospitals? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, again, um, we do rely on our health care professionals to provide care. Um, they are in a difficult situation. We are in a difficult situation. If we could uh, magically um, find some internist, obviously this decision wouldn't be made. It's a, it's a Canada-wide problem. It's not unique to Prince Edward Island, and we'll continue to work on it to try to solve it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yes, everybody's... Thank you, Madam Speaker. I guess everybody just wants to, to get reassured that you have done everything you possibly could to avoid this situation. And that's where we're getting at, because you don't shut down 40% ICU capacity in an entire province and not expect to have questions about it. Well, I'm just going to move a little bit to, to follow-up care. I was told that the decision will further hamper our health care system's ability to offer basic follow-up care to patients Due to the strain on our hospitals, this closure will place on them. Question to the minister. What steps did you take to ensure follow-up care will not be negatively affected, and can you share them with this House here and now? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We recognize the impact this has on the system. Again, the foundational services that we've lost at the PCH. A lot of things depend on internal medicine. So we understand 
that there is a ripple effect within healthcare. We, we're doing everything we can, again, from locum searches um, and again to recruiting to try to fix the situation. But this is the reality that we were in. Again, we rely on the professionals at Health PEI to operationalize and to try to mitigate as much as we can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I didn't get anything about follow-up care. This is serious. People in Western Prince Edward Island need this, and they need to have better answers than that, Minister. Um, once again, the, the Minister offers zero details about the plan. Question, when will the Minister stand up and apologize to the patients, staffs, and family for your poor handling, and the poor handling about this, this entire situation, even worse, the communication of this closure? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I've done that for the last two days here in the legislature. We, this, again, it's a regrettable situation. I understand that. Um, I, I, I do feel for, for all of the people affected for this. So, again, staff, if we could fix a wave of magic wand and, and create staff that we need in these facilities, we would do it. There is no doubt that we would do this. Uh, uh, this is not an ideal situation. And obviously, we'll, we'll work as best we can to try to, to get through it. And, and again, we rely on our health care providers to get us through this tough situation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And much respect to you for answering these tough questions. It's tough. Um, but, but these are very, very important. Uh, Madam Speaker, we saw today that the Nurses Union came out and asserted that their members were giving no prior notice to the ability to provide input on this closure. This is the same group that had rallied on the steps of the Confederation Centre just to get the government to take their needs seriously. Question to the Minister. Is your plan to continue disrespecting the frontline staff who keep our health care system running throughout the tenure of, of your ministry? When will your government finally start putting a value on the opinion of frontline workers? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we value our nurses. We, we certainly do. They are the, uh, one of the cornerstones of our health care system. I have a child that's in the nursing program at, at the University of Prince Edward Island, so I'm, I'm very close to, to that sector. So I understand the commitment that they make, the care that they have, and the call of duty that they have to their positions. Um, again, we're trying to maintain pa patient safety, and we understand that we are asking a lot from our nurses. We recognize that. Um, hopefully the new collective agreement will help um, in recognizing some of that commitment. But again, we value them and we, and we will always appreciate our nurses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm the leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the official opposition suggests that there's a lot of discomfort on the other side of the room. I, you look pretty comfy to me. I mean, the only way they'd be more comfortable is if the pages were to deliver a dozen pairs of slippers and some blankies over there, from what I can tell. So let's ask some hard questions here. Earlier this year, the CBC reported that 70% of island private long-term care facilities had failed inspections at one point or another within the past year. In their reporting, they covered a graphic story of a patient in a private long-term care home, and that patient had developed necrosis. That's when parts of your body, when tissues of your body die, and it's extremely painful and it's irreversible. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Why are there effectively no consequences for private long-term care facilities that provide such substandard care and keep failing inspections? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, the long-term uh, long care, uh, our, our operators uh, have been challenged with staffing, again, um, throughout the pandemic. Again, the complaint system is in there to help them re uh, remedy those complaints. Obviously, the, um, the step in that is to close beds, and, and nobody wants that. So we do work with our partners in order to remedy uh, that, those, those shortfalls that they may have uh, in their operations. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Leader of the third party. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. And evidence shows that public long-term care delivers better care and better outcomes than private long-term care. There's endless studies to support that, and of course our experience during COVID across the country would also support that. Often the, private, the profit motive means that less investment is made in staff and direct patient care. But despite this, Prince Edward Island has one of the highest rates of private for-profit care in the country, almost half. My question again for the Minister of Health. Do Conservatives believe that private profit trumps our seniors' right to care and safety? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and thank the honourable member for the question. Obviously, as you know, we're undertaking a long-term care review. It should be done very soon, and obviously, uh, hopefully that will guide us as we move forward. Um, we're analyzing data from surveys, stakeholder interviews, submissions, and public consultations. So that's an important part of this process and how we move, care, uh, move forward with our long-term care industry on Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Leader of the third party, your first supplementary. Thanks again, Madam Speaker. Um, and of course, we've been waiting a very long time for this yes. long-term care long, report. Long -term. Uh, it was promised last fall and then in the spring, and we still haven't seen it. Islanders expect and deserve better care for their elders, and it's government's job to make sure that they get it. Recently, national standards for long-term care have been developed federally to ensure high-quality, patient-centric care for all folks in long-term care. But the throne speech made no mention of that, made no commitment to their implementation. It's a question to the same minister. Can you tell us if and when government will legislate the national standards for long-term care? Uh, minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do agree with the, the leader of the third party that they are very important and those new national long-term care standards will help guide the development of the plan for this sector. So we expect to see that in the long-term uh, care review a recommendation. So obviously when those recommendations come in, Why I'm confident that we will act on those recommendations. Why Thank you. <coughs> Member of the third, or leader of the third party. Oh, that was my second oh, Sorry. Uh, member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's certainly not surprising that this government's trying to cover up some of the substandard care our island seniors are experiencing. I was shocked but not surprised to learn that we had patients being transferred from private care facilities to public care facilities in the hopes that they would receive better care. Minister, in the last two years, how many long-term care patients have been transferred to public long-term care because of poor care and health? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I will bring that data back to the House uh, at, at, a, at a later time. Thank you. Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. For Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I tell you, those numbers are concerning when you get them. Government knows there are many issues with long-term care, and that's undoubtedly one of the reasons why the province commissioned the external review into long-term care. First, it was promised for the fall 2022, then it was winter 2023. Now it's spring, and Islanders still have no idea when this government intends to be transparent and release this report. Can the minister please tell us why his government is hiding the findings of the long-term care external review? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the honourable member for the question. I do agree with you. It's a very important document. Uh, I look forward to seeing it as well. It will guide our decisions, and I expect it very, very soon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Soon is not good enough. This should have been released when it was first when it was first promised. These are human beings that we are talking about who are receiving horrific care under your government. Of course, this isn't the only long-term care information being withheld from Islanders. In the past year, we've seen dozens and dozens of COVID hospitalizations and deaths tied to long-term care, yet the province has stopped reporting this data. Our office FOIPed outbreak summaries in residential care facilities and PEI only to find that government stopped pr producing them in August 2022. Can the Minister of Health explain how it benefits island seniors to stop the tra tracking and reporting of a life-threatening th life illness? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I think I would refer to the, the CPHO office. Again, I think we've seen in the hit in the past that we rely on their expertise and their recommendations in, in order to how to communicate with the public. So again, that's a decision that that office makes. And um, I, would, I would direct that question more to, to that office. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honorable member from uh, Borden Concora. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our province is leading the way when it comes to protecting the environment except in one area. Presently, there are 87 petroleum retail outlets across the island dispensing over 219 million litres of fuel per year. Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, this number is staying constant. It's not changing. With the move towards electric vehicles, more efficient gas and diesel vehicles, and more public transit, we need to be transforming all of Prince Edward Island to more environmentally efficient ways of distributing all energy sources available. With that, we need to support our small family-owned businesses that are struggling across the island. Yes, sir. 
Question, Question to the Minister of the Environment. <laughs> How is your department going to support these petroleum outlet stations deliver energy-based products in the future? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you. So, you know, and thank you, obviously, for the question because I, I don't get a whole lot of them, and I do agree the work we're doing in here is, is very important, and uh, I, we do lead the way. We lead the entire country, and there's uh, there's categories which we lead the entire world. So we're, we should be very proud as Islanders. Indeed, we are. Our bus transition is ahead of everyone in the entire world. Um, but you know, Madam Speaker, we do have a program. We partner with NRCAN to deliver through, uh, effic through efficiency PEI to allow businesses who want to switch to different sources, i.e. charging stations. We, we partner with them now. You see many of them going up. Our charging network has grown significantly here. It will grow significantly again th this summer. Um, obviously, we, we want to help those businesses, particularly the ones who deliver gasoline to engines right now, to transition over into a way that they'll be able to survive and find a, a profit model that's going to work for them in the future. So if you have any other recommendations, I'd certainly take them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the member from Gordon can call you for supplementary. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, question to the Minister of Economic Growth. These retail outlets supply a range of products across the island. Do they have your support and your department's support to continue with energy-based product delivery, and how are you going to assist them transform into new delivery models? Um, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. And yes, uh, they would have our support and we, uh, through our department, will assist any uh, organizations to try to make uh, improvements to any kind of uh, thing, anything that could uh, grow the economy here in Prince Edward Island. Thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. We have now we have the support of two ministers, the Minister of the Environment and also the Minister of Growth, in helping these retail outlets and small businesses move forward into the future. Question to the Minister of Environment. Will the Minister of Environment be the first minister in North America to freeze the issuing of any new petroleum storage tank licenses and work towards helping the existing petroleum retail outlets transform into delivering new clean energy systems across the island. Uh, well, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. So yeah, there's a lot in that in that question. On it, I guess let's let's start with uh, helping helping uh, any business transition over. We're going to be there for them 100%. We uh, because we are leaders in this nation, and because in subcategories we're leaders in the world. Uh, we want to continue to put our money where our mouth is. And we want to continue to. <laughs> will I put a freeze on? Well, I will say we're undertaking uh, our energy blueprint, which you may have read about. It has a meeting tonight in Alberton, and it, it's dealing with all facets of energy. So it's not just about electricity. It's about energy, energy use, energy future, and what we should do for policies for, for the future. So I think the timing is perfect for you to bring this forward, and we'll definitely put it in our document and have fierce discussion over it and report back to the House. Thank you. Honourable member from Surrey, Elmira. <laughs> well, Madam Speaker, it's going to be hard to follow up after, after that. Yeah. We know. <laughs> Tourism is one of the largest industries in our province, and we have some of the most beautiful parks uh, and settings you'll find anywhere. The annual budget for our 23 day parks and eight campgrounds is falling far short of what is required to maintain and repair the infrastructure, let alone expanding and or growing our parks. A question to the Minister of Tourism. How is your department intending to address this funding gap when it comes to maintaining our parks? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, uh, Sports and Leisure, Sports and Culture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a full, full title nice there. Um, yes, no, I, I do agree, honorable, honorable Member. Uh, the capital that we receive each year, I think it's 750000 to maintain 20-some parks isn't quite sufficient. The former minister didn't lobby for any more, so we weren't, we're not we very short on, on our budget there, so we're... <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll certainly uh, make good friends with the finance minister here, and hopefully in the fall we can increase that budget a little bit. <laughs> First 
supplementary. I don't see the electric bus coming. <laughs> I saw it on Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister of Tourism for his answer. Uh, you're right, the 700000 that uh, we have annually is not even close to what, uh, what we need. Uh, I'm aware that a number of our parks are in need of significant upgrades and repairs, but especially Basin Head and Red Point Provincial Parks, which are in my district, Surrey Elmira. Both Basin Head and Red Point Provincial Park are in serious need as the Minister and I seen in our recent tour of both parks. Question to the Minister of Tourism. Does our government have a plan in place to address the needs of these two parks, Basin Head and Red Point in particular? Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So on, on the limited budget that we do have, we basically just maintain them just to keep them going each year. Um, but we're going to work to develop a, perhaps a five-year plan a, a strategy to address some of the significant infrastructure upgrades that we need um, at all of our parks. So I know there is, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity for expansion at some of our uh, campgrounds and parks and um, we're going to put forward an actual plan in the department and present it when the capital budget comes and, and uh, we'll see what happens then. Thank you. Honorable Member from Surrey Elmira, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That all sounds very promising. Um, <laughs> Red Point Campground operates at 100% capacity and has been for a number of years. There is an opportunity to expand the park with room to add approximately 20 additional sites. This would allow more of our tourists and our locals alike the opportunity to enjoy the beautiful surroundings Red Point offers. Question to the Minister of Tourism. Is our government willing to invest in expanding Red Point Park and if so, is there a time frame in mind? Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, we'll certainly, we're certainly going to look at it and, and it will be, it'll be part of that, uh, that five-year that five plan that we're going to uh, come up with. There's a number of parks that could be expanded and that is one of them. I think the cost would be about 1.5 million to add those sites to it. So it'll certainly be part of the plan that we submit. I can promise you that. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Oh, sorry. Honourable Member of O'Leary Inverness. <laughs> Almost. 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 <laughs> Question to the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Does your department have any policies or protocols that encourage government departments to locate in incorporated municipalities, or do you support uh, moving government agencies to unincorporated municipalities? Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to speak for the first time in the legislature. Uh, I'm sure that I'll have ample opportunity. Um, I, I lost my uh, opportunity to, to get your attention earlier to speak, and I'll just uh, digress for a minute to say that I'm proud to be wearing my, my purple jacket in support of uh, Family Violence Prevention Week. Um, I do, in fact, own it. I didn't buy it just for today. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Honourable Member, for the question. Um, we do not, in fact, ha have any policy in my department. Uh, I assume that you're referring uh, uh, to the question that you asked yesterday to the Minister for Workforce uh, Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, I would have to say that um, the government is entitled to apply for a development permit in any area of Prince Edward Island. Um, absent any policy that says otherwise, uh, it is quite possible that after we go through the process of our provincial land use planning process that something of that nature might be uh, incorporated. But at this time, government services can be uh, located uh, uh, anywhere in the provinces. It would be important that government maybe sets a precedent right now because that's right. It may be something that when you do your land policy reviews that uh, you look at that, uh, Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker. Uh, the three larger western municipalities formed a group, the O'Leary, Tignish and Alberton uh, Association for Municipalities. And on a regular basis they meet to discuss issues becoming, you know, basically their issues around health care, 
issues around housing issues, as well as uh, government policies that would uh, impact uh, incorporated communities. At a recent meeting, uh, the O'Leary, Tignish, and uh, Alberton uh, municipalities unanimously agreed that government services taken out of incorporated municipalities will have negative impacts on them all and sends a bad signal uh, to the value of uh, being located in an incorporated municipality. Will the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities discuss this issue with the new Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning so she can understand the precedent that this uh, decision will make on incorporated municipalities and PEI and encourage her to have Skills PEI stay in O'Leary? Honourable oh, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm very encouraged to hear that the, uh, the municipalities in West Prince are discussing um, issues of importance to all the municipalities in the area. Uh, we certainly encourage municipalities to, to speak about uh, uh, items of interest in the regions. And um, in this case, um, I will have to defer to the department with responsibility for this decision, but uh, they are certainly discussions that we will have. Uh, I will take your, uh, your, your question into consideration and, uh, and let you know how, how we feel about it. Uh, the member from O'Leary and Bernice. Uh, thanks, so, Madam Speaker. And I think this, you know, one of the issues that this decision will have, it not only has an issue on the incorporated municipalities, but it also has uh, issues uh, pretending to uh, uh, businesses in the area. So with this pending move of Skills PEI and CDS out of the Future Tech West building, these are anchor tenants in this building. And this building was designed or developed by the O'Leary Development Corporation as an incubator uh, services to new businesses starting up. So if they all move out by uh, April 2024, the other remaining small businesses are concerned about their future. Businesses like ASTA Training, Career Bridges, STEM, and other incubator businesses. What or where do these businesses go uh, if anchor tenants leave? Uh, does the minister support businesses moving outside of incorporated municipalities? Honorable Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I certainly appreciate the honourable member's concern for the service for service delivery in his uh, region. Um, as uh, as of this time, we have no policies surrounding that. It's certainly something that we can look at. And as I said, it's uh, uh, we like to we like to have services where in, in our communities where uh, where residents can take advantage of those most easily. And uh, we'll welcome your input on future decisions, but uh, without uh, uh, policies regarding this at this time, uh, I, again, I have to defer to this decision making to the uh, department with responsibility for, for, for this service. Honourable Member from O'Leary and Vernest, your final question. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. Uh, but I think it's important to note that the uh, minister here responsible for communities has to take a leadership role. He's, he's the minister responsible for all of these municipalities out there. Over half of Prince Edward Island is an incorporated municipality. The previous minister was always out meeting with these municipalities and encouraged them and discouraged. <laughs> you know, very, very hard working. So, so uh, Minister, will you meet with Mayor Gavin and the O'Leary Municipal Council to discuss issues of moving skills PEI to an unincorporated municipality? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm certainly open to meeting with uh, any municipal leaders at any time. Uh, I understand this is an important issue to you, and uh, I believe it's something that uh, perhaps the municipal leaders can raise up uh, through their conversations with the Federation of PEI Municipalities. As I said, in the absence of any policy, um, I'll defer that decision making to the, uh, the department responsible for skills PEI at this time, but I'm willing to consider policies that help boost municipalities and the services that are available there. Question period. Um, now, statements by ministers, starting with the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure for me to rise today to extend my congratulations to students and graduating from Holland College, the University of Prince Edward Island, and College de Lille. Starting this week, hundreds of students will be putting on their regalia and walking across the stage to receive their degrees diplomas, and certificates. It's a special moment for them, and they should be celebrating this wonderful achievement. It's also a special moment for their loved ones, friends, and faculty, too. Throughout their academic journey, students have worked hard over the course of their program to develop the skills and knowledge that soon they will be able to put into practice. 
As Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, it's clear to me that investments in post-secondary education means investments into our workforce. The strategic partnerships we have built with our post-secondary institutions have been incredibly beneficial for students and employers alike. Whether that's enhancing student financial aid through bursaries and loan forgiveness, supporting tuition costs for workers going through training, such as resident care worker, tailoring existing programs to be more flexible and fast-tracked sect for sectors like correctional services, or building programs to grow our local capacity for mental health and other healthcare professionals. These are just a few examples of how we can be creative and work together to make our province better. By being innovative and collaborative, this is part of how we will grow and sustain ourselves as a province, and I'm so proud of how we are doing this together. No matter what field graduates have chosen to pursue, we know that when they enter the workforce, they will be making immediate and meaningful contributions to our communities. So today, Madam Speaker, I want to congratulate all our post-secondary students again for this wonderful achievement. I know that, they will, that we will all see the positive impact they're making across our communities and across all sectors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Speaker. I too want to congratulate our uh, post-secondary graduates, especially from our college institutions out there, uh, Madam Speaker, and I certainly commend the Minister in uh, bringing this, uh, highlighting their attention to this. Uh, uh, I certainly want to congratulate them on behalf of our uh, caucus as well, uh, Madam Speaker. I too am gra a graduate. I graduated from urban and rural planning, Madam Speaker, uh, many, many years ago. So that's why I know the value of supporting our incorporated municipalities and making sure our government agencies and businesses are uh, and try to develop traffic flow in these uh, uh, municipalities. I also uh, think of uh, some of the places I've worked uh, uh, when I worked at Community Inclusions, Human Services, the programs that were offered uh, to those uh, trainees are so valuable in how we deal with people with intellectual disabilities and people with di other disabilities. Uh, our LPN program, our RCW program, we're certainly finding uh, quite a shortage of uh, all of those workers in those professions and uh, I believe it's really important that our college institutions are providing these services in, in our rural communities. You can't always expect people, especially I said, single mothers, to travel from West Point to or Cape Wolf to uh, Summerside or Charlottetown sometimes. And I do recall that we've had LPN and RCW training at Future Tech West, I might add, to the minister uh, responsible over there. And uh, th those services were all encompassing in, uh, and allowed those people to get the training and be valuable in the, our communities. I think if our uh, tradespeople, uh, Madam Speaker, our welders, our mechanics, all those people in construction trades, all of those professions are in high demand and they're usually pretty good paying professions. Uh, I also think of another one that's out there is the, our uh, culinary skills. The Holland College has our culinary institute and uh, you know there's a big demand for cooks, uh, sous chefs, uh, servers, bartenders, all of those professions. And I think it's once again important that these facilities that are these institutions provide these services and training out in our rural communities uh, so people don't have to travel as far. And I think when we do that, we will see more success and we'll make sure more people are fully gainfully employed and contributing to our com economy here in Prince Edward Island, Madam Speaker. Thank you. From Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for bringing this forward. It's a wonderful uh, honour to be able to congratulate all of our post-secondary education graduates in the province. Your hard work, dedication and commitment over all of these years has certainly paid off today and, and when you graduate. And, and a big thank you to your families also for those of you who've had that support um, to help make this moment possible. Um, it was mentioned different ways that we can support post-secondary institutions, whether it be tailoring programs, offering financial support, bursaries. All of those things, of course, are crucial to ensure that island students can make their way through post-secondary institutions. I'd also like to mention the things that might not come so obvious to our minds when we think about education, and that's housing. If students don't have a place to live, they can't go to school. And so, you know, as part of those efforts, we can't look at these things in silos. We must look at these things as being all connected. 
Um, also, food insecurity is a massive thing that we've heard from post-secondary uh, institution students in the last four years I've been in this role. I've heard a lot about that, so supporting them. I know the food banks at, at, um, at UPEI in particular um, have noticed huge uptakes and, on that. So food insecurity and housing play a big role there. Um, a couple of other things we can do to show our congrats through actions is looking at how we can use the talent, skills, and knowledge we have in our post-secondary education students. When we think of the big, complex, wicked problems we have here in this province, why are we not using them more for, to fund research projects to, to get them to solve these problems? I think that it could be a really unique partnership, and for some reason the province just doesn't take advantage of that, and that's really a missed opportunity. Um, we also can work better with our PEI institutions, so I know that that's a partnership that, that is going now, but we could do much, much better in tailoring our programs to fit the needs we have in our labour force and in the program and incorporating that into our, our high school uh, career exploration programs. We could be doing much, much more to solve a lot of the... Um, the human resource challenges that we have not just in the province but across the country, but we could be leaders here. We've got a small size, we've got close connections and relationships. So uh, a bit off, a bit getting off the trail there, but just coming back to congratulate all of our post-secondary institution uh, graduates that are graduating this year. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Even though it's been months since Fiona hit our province, we are still cleaning up from this devastating storm. We had 6,100 requests for private property tree cleanup after Fiona. Crews have worked diligently, they have worked hard whenever the weather allowed, and we are working on the last 300 properties as we speak. Madam Speaker, this is huge progress, but we know Islanders still need help. Trees are weak in some areas, and they could be at risk of falling during windy weather. Additional trees may have fallen over the winter months. To help Islanders with fallen trees in their yards, government will once again be offering tree cleanup service on private residential properties. Residents can start applying on Tuesday, May 23rd of this spring. Residents can apply online at PrinceEdwardIsland.ca backslash Fiona Cleanup, or you can visit one of our Access PEI locations across the province, or Madam Speaker, contact PEI at 1 833 734 1873 if you need assistance with your application. To make sure people most in need get help as soon as possible, we are limiting the cleanup to residential yards. We will be providing the same service as we did last fall. We will be removing trees that are leaning towards residential structures or accesses to structures. We can also remove trees that have fallen on a residential lawn. If you applied in the fall, you do not need to apply again. You're still on our list and we will get to you as quickly as possible. Provincial crews also continue to pick up brush, branches, and trees that residents have piled at the roadside. If you have the means to bring your own debris to the road, please do this by June 30th. This will help us focus on providing help to those with mobility issues, lack of access to proper tools, and other barriers to their own cleanup. If you've left your debris near the road, there is no need to notify us. Crews will pick up the debris when they're in the area. Finally, Madam Speaker, since Fiona arrived on our shores, there have been many individuals who have helped our cleanup and recovery efforts. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is still pitching in to help Islanders get back to normal after that devastating storm. And Madam Speaker, I also want to take the opportunity to thank all the ones in my department that have worked so hard over the last number of months to aid in this uh, cleanup. A very special thank you to those staff members. I'm the leader of the opposition. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, so this is welcoming to see that it's been uh, open again for applications to come in. I've received uh, many calls uh, since uh, Fiona hit last fall uh, regarding cleanup and concerns of trees that have either fallen or are leaning over on electrical lines or uh, coming into their homes or on their uh, property boundary lines. Um, so there was a you know 6,100 applicants. That's a huge number. So to see that now down to around 300, I know it was around 4,100, I think, about a month ago. So they're getting them down there. So it's nice to see that. It's really good to see that it's reopening because I had citizens that just didn't make that application, uh, hit that timeline last. Um, some of them just uh, were away at the time. Some of them just didn't even know about it, to be quite honest. So anyway, I'll make sure that they, uh, they're they aware that it's, it's reopened. I want to thank the Department of Transportation, uh, their subcontractors and the municipalities, anybody who had any part in the cleanup efforts uh, to date and their uh, continuing uh, efforts. Uh, definitely because it makes uh, life so much easier for those who have a residential property but don't have the means to, to clean up uh, the branches or the, the debris that's been in their yard, especially our senior citizens and, and, and those who don't have, uh, uh, let's say, a truck or, or what have you, or have some kind of a disability that, that prevents them from getting out there and doing so. So um, I want to thank the, the Minister of uh, Transportation for this announcement and for reopening uh, up to the public, and I will make sure that I have it on Facebook so everyone in my district is aware of it. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, like the Leader of the Official Opposition, this is a very welcome announcement. Thank you, Minister. I'm, as you may or may not be aware, I sent you an email this morning from my latest constituent who inquired about whether or not this program might come back or be extended or whether they were still on the list from last fall because they're one of the 300 left over. So this is absolutely welcome news and necessary news. I mean, you don't have to go far around the island to see just how much work there is yet to do to clean things up. And that's not at all a criticism of those who've been working extremely hard for the last six months. Uh, astonishing work has been done, but just the sheer scope of the destruction across our island is... Uh, it's, it, it still astonishes me. I, I haven't driven from tip to tip since the, the uh, since Fiona arrived, but I've been in many, many corners. Actually, I was walking with Pat Mella this morning during the, the walk in silence, and uh, we weren't entirely silent, I must admit, for a portion of this. I haven't seen Pat in quite a while. And the first thing she talked about was how devastated she is as she drives around the province and looks at, at what's happened to our forests. So, um, I, I, uh, I'm very pleased to hear this announcement, Minister, and I thank you for it. Um, I too, like the Leader of the Official Opposition, will be encouraging my constituents and making sure that this word gets out there. Um, there's a lot of work left to do. I, I'm, I, I'm going to have to listen back carefully or look at the, the criteria for this program. I, I heard you say trees that are leaning or dangerously on properties or on a lawn. I have many people who perhaps don't have a lawn, but a lot of trees down on their property, and I'd like to know whether you know how, what the criteria are for uh, them being able to have assistance in, in removing that, because not everybody's handy with a chainsaw, and not everybody can afford to have somebody come in and, and do that for them. So I uh, appreciate this, and I hope that the criteria, the parameters are flexible enough to allow those uh, people who really need a clean up on their property to take advantage of it. Thank you, Minister. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We all know having access to a computer is essential in this day and age. That is why Computers for Success is such an important program and it creates positive impact on the lives of many people in this province. Computers for Success is a federally funded program here in PEI and it's run by the IT Shared Services Department under the Department of Finance. The program accepts donations of computers, printers, laptops, and monitors. Trained technicians replace parts. They clear the hard drives and install new systems and software to get the do donation ready for the next user. The program focuses on delivering the refurbished computers to schools, libraries, non-for-profit organizations, charities, indigenous communities, and eligible low-income low islanders. Not only does it benefit those who receive the computer, it also keeps these computers out of landfills. We all know our world drastically changed in 2020, and our going digital is more important than ever. 
it's our way of staying connected when we had to stay apart. And I have to just go off script for a second. My grandmother um, is in her 90s, and uh, she just had a big birthday yesterday, Rose Shivery. Um, we got her an iPad um, in the thick of 2020, in the thick of COVID, and for her to be able to have access to the family through her iPad was night and day. So I appreciate that line about staying connected. Madam Speaker, I'm proud to share that since 2020, the Computers for Success program has delivered over 6,500 computers to islanders and island organizations. In addition to running this program, we also provide internships for students that gives them hands-on experience in the field of information technology. Hiring preferences are given to individuals of underrepresented groups. And I encourage anyone who needs a computer or wishes to donate to the program to visit our website, princeedwardisland.ca, and search Computers for Success or call 902-620-3226. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for making uh, this announcement today. I know that in the past, back in 2000, uh, prior to, I think it was 2018 maybe, there was computers for schools at that time where it kept uh, old computers out of the landfills, put them into schools. Um, they, were, were, they were much needed and much used, uh, and then Computers for Success came in, I think, uh, around that time, um, which, as the Minister said, helped nonprofits, seniors, and, and those who don't have access to, um, whether it could be um, just not having, I guess, the funds to, to, to purchase one. So I know I have helped many, many in my district access these computers in the past, um, and a lot of not for profit organizations, uh, which are very um, pleased to receive them, especially some of the seniors' uh, organizations in my community, um, even students during COVID. Um, many parents didn't have access to a, let's say, a laptop uh, for their child to study at home. So this program was able to um, help those students, help those parents uh, do some online learning, and it was very, very much appreciated um, by each individual or each family or, or, and by the school, um, those who received it. So I um, uh, want to thank both the federal and provincial governments for their participation in this program and their continued support for it because I know firsthand, I've, I've delivered many of them, from, you know, they'd call Charlottetown, and so I had to deliver them from Charlottetown to, and I have some in order, um, to bring back to my uh, area. Uh, so I know firsthand how important uh, this program is. So thank you very much. Uh, presenting and receiving petitions. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Apologize, Minister, uh, or sorry, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. No, no problem at all. Um, thank you, Minister, for this announcement. I mean, a, a, obviously a long-standing program, but an important one. And I love the personal story you gave about Rose Chevry and your grandmother and, and how important it was for her. And most of us have elderly relatives of some form or another and um, who may not be as familiar or comfortable using technology as us youngsters are. And I am fully aware of how important it is for that sector of our community to be given an opportunity to do this. So I know, I know this is going to many, many places, nonprofits, libraries, as, as well as schools and, and elsewhere. Um, but I'm particularly charmed and, and understand how important it is to get them to people like your grandmother. Uh, I'm, the other aspect of this, and you, you said it very eloquently in your minister statement, is the fact that this diverts it diverts a lot of material from our landfill sites. Um, we're not great at building things to be repaired and reused. In fact, there are some jurisdictions around the world that are, are bringing legislation in to, to enshrine a right to repair for certain things so that they can actually be repaired rather because often it's just one small element of it that needs to be fixed in order for it to be completely functional again. So this is an example of a, a program that encourages and pays for and, and will distribute repaired goods. And it's great in every way. So thank you, Minister, for, for the statement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions, uh, tabling of documents, uh, the Honourable Minister of uh, Education and Early Years. Madam Speaker, 
Speaker, by command of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Department of Education Lifelong Learning Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2022, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. Uh, Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to leave to the table the lease agreements uh, related to the Skills PEI office relocation requested by the Honourable Member Valerian Furness, the SJJ question period, and I move sec and seconded by Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Amen. Leader, leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table several documents that I cited in question period today. It's a series of media reports chronicling uh, stories of substandard care in island long-term care facilities. And I move, seconded by the member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the said documents be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. <laughs> Honourable member from uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, COVID-19 outbreak summaries in long-term care facilities on the island, and I move seconded by the leader of the third party that the said docu document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, at this time, I'll call motion number one back to the floor. Okay. We weren't quite ready for you, but we'll... <laughs> We didn't do reports by committees <laughs> and introduction of government bills. <laughs> Motions other than government. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I'll call motion number one. Back to the floor. At this time. <laughs> Madam Speaker, motion number one is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the seconder, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yes, a member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, I look forward to uh, picking up uh, talking about this important motion and and you know it. it just to, to recap, it's about emergency rooms about uh, across our province and how they're how they become an important pillar in in service for Islanders, and they're really the backbone for every MLA in here. I think it's it's important that, um, like I said yesterday, that when you're in a time of need, you're you're very scared, your family's scared, your your loved one needs support. You want to make sure that that you're able to to uh, to have access timely, close to home, and that becomes important. So this motion is is talking about that and, and ways that we can have a look at the system and make sure we report back to this legislature about those things and, and make sure that, that they're all functioning perfectly in our area. And I don't know if this is happening, Madam Speaker, and, and we, we look at that the, the, the situation in the Summerside ICU and, and you know, Islanders have, have reached out from, to me with, with the experience about working there and the experience about what's happening there and they're not potentially happy with some of the decisions and the speed of the decisions that are being made and I mean if anybody in West Prince or Summerside and MLAs, uh, you, you're, you have to be hearing this, you have to be hearing this. You're, you're, this is an important. This is an important function, and and that possible to be to be able to look at and, and to use the words a few. Uh, this is only going to affect a few people. No, I, I think it's quite a bit more than that. How many people did the ICU in Prince County Hospital um, help in 2022? How many? Do you know what, what's that number? Each one of those. It's not just a number. It's a person in the area that got great care from great staff, and that staff wasn't told about anything going on. And what happened to that ICU? Guess what, the minister says uh, uh, three, three people, three people were, were moved, and now you're more than that. Um, where did they go? They went to the QEH ICU. How many beds are at the QCH ICU? Eight, eight beds, eight beds. 
So minister says three, I say, I say six or seven. So then what happens? Maybe only three got into the ICU at Q QEH. Maybe that's what, it, what they were talking about because that's probably the only the capacity they had. But one of the things I can probably pretty much tell you is those beds are full. So what happens to everybody else that could have had ICU uh, support in Summerside? Where do they go? Where do they go? And that's why this motion's important because they go to the QEH, but, but what's gonna happen? Where will they end up? In the emergency room, in the emergency room. And that's not fair to Islanders because we're talking about safety uh, around uh, the, the Prince County Hospital. I'm, I'm thinking about safety all across the board and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what's happening. We need to review our emergency room capacity in Prince Edward Island. So I look forward to people talking to, to this motion because we need, we need to know and, and the government needs to know. If they're not, if they're not talking about this, if, if the uh, uh, CEO has not explained things properly to the Minister of Health, we are, there, there's a block in communication. The Premier would like to say it's political. I say that's, a, that's something that should be communicated to the Minister of Health. The Minister of Health should know that there's something coming down the road that could affect the emergency rooms and, and two different ICUs. So that's important. And if we pass this motion, we put pressure to make sure that, hey, you know what? By a certain date, we need to understand that the emergency rooms are very important and I Islanders are telling us that. Islanders told you at the doors that that's an important piece of what they're doing because you know what? If our emergency rooms are not functioning properly, it puts strain on patients. How many stories have you heard for multiple hours at emergency facilities? If they're even open, it's, it's, it's a terrible strain on patients. And you know what Prince Edward Island is, is up amongst the leaders in the country are? People that go to the emergency room for care and leave. And they leave, they leave because they, they for some reason or another, they, they've been told that the wait's gonna be too long. And, and that, that's very scary. We have to fix these numbers. We have to do in this legislature, um, and we have to put pressure on collectively to make sure that doesn't happen because there has to be standards set that, that we get service in, in, a, in a timely manner if we can. Um, the stress on the patients, the strain on the patients, um, we ta I talked about the, the, uh, the offloading of patients um, uh, for, for ambulance services, that I, I'm sure that everybody heard at the doors, that was, that was, that was a big deal. That's when we've been talking about this for two years. My colleague from O'Leary and Verness uh, was on this well before anybody else was. Um, and he talked about this extensively and he actually made some changes with the things that he said because it was interesting to listen and how he framed that debate. So um, th those are important points for not only West Prince, East Prince, Charlottetown, anywhere in between. Okay, our ambulance services need to be on the road and, and, and they should not be waiting in a bay of any hospital because they're, they're waiting with patients that, that need them there. Um, that, that's, that's an important thing and that happens more often, more often than not. Are we, in, are we in a crisis? Are we in a crisis right now? I don't know what you define as a crisis. I think, I think announcing an ICU closure or partially announcing an ICU closure on Friday happening on Sunday throughout the weekend and then further communication coming out on Monday is a crisis, is a, is a crisis for a community. After that community just had a public meeting um, two weeks before to talk about it. Seven weeks before that, we heard that we were not we were not closing, we were not gonna close the ICU. The ICU was not gonna close. Don't worry about it, it's not gonna happen in the PCU and guess what? Seven weeks later, it's closed. And to get an ICU back open, we have to work hard to do that. We have to make sure that we're on it because the people of Summerside, the, the, the children of Summerside, the seniors, our parents, um, everybody in between needs that to happen. The people that we represent need that to happen and it affects the whole entire system as a whole. 
So these are, these are some of the, the issues why this motion is important. Emergency departments are the backbone of our healthcare system. And this motion states that. But, but one, of the things, one of the things I'm worried about, PEI is the most beautiful place in the country. We would all agree, PEI is the most beautiful place in the country. In the summer times, we have some of the best dairy farms there are in Canada. Yeah, I just wanted to see if I could get an applause over there from the Deputy <laughs> Premier. Um, we, have, we have some incredible things. You, when you come to Prince Edward Island, you, you, don't need, you don't need a car, you just need yourself, you need a bicycle, whatever you want to do. You can see Prince Edward Island in seconds and it could make you feel a certain way that you can't feel anywhere else in the country. It's just that beautiful and that's what we have. And guess what people do? They come here and we're getting increase in flights coming in. Uh, you know, the government did a pretty good job of supporting YYG as the local airport. I mean, I'll, I'll give some credit there. It's, it's, going, it's going well after COVID and that's very important. But guess what, ha guess what, guess what the flights bring into Prince Edward Island? They bring in lots of people and lots of excited people. And people in a new place that, that you know, God forbid they come on vacation and they do need, they do need services or they do have to, have to go to an emergency room for something or other. Um, our population increases with the tourists to see this beautiful place. And that is what, and if that doesn't create a, a pit in the bottom of our stomach, with thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of more people will come to this province. And our, our emergency services that, that are here, ready for them, I have to say at this time, I'm very worried about that. And that's why this motion is important. And given the recent, given the recent um, uh, issues that we're having with the PCU, um, that's why uh, today with this motion I thought about it and after the last few days of question, question period, I don't feel great about the timelines around this motion. We need to know, we need to know what's happening well in advance of, I think it says September 30th in this, in this, uh, in this motion about figuring, figuring out what to happen and what, we, what we're going to do. So with, with that being said, Mr. Speaker, well done, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I, um, at this time, I, I think it's appropriate that I would like your indulgence to uh, uh, move a motion to this, um, to the, to this, uh, uh, move an amendment to this motion um, to to adjust that that timeline. So, with your indulgence, I'll, can I may I read this the the amendment? Yes. And uh, I move. An amendment to motion one that in the final and therefore be it resolved clause, the following words will be removed September 30th and replaced with the following words June 14th. Honorable Member, do you have copies? I do have copies. You'll need a second, or honourable member. Thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, the leader of the official opposition will second that. Members will just take a moment until the uh, amendment is distributed, and then we will debate the amendment. Thank you. All right. Honourable members, does everybody have a copy that would like one? All right, I'll go to the uh, seconder of the amendment to speak to it. Uh, you've already spoken. Yeah, so. Well, I moved it, but I, I, well, can I speak to the motion or the amendment? 
You've spoken to it. Mr. Speaker, so uh, it's unfortunate that I have to stand up and, and, and second uh, this amendment to the motion. Um, we had originally, um, or I had put this forward yesterday and, and spoke on it, uh, and the reason why we we're making this uh, change, this amendment to it, is because of the large amount of calls, of messages that we've received from healthcare staff right across the island, from um, constituents, um, from our own districts and from other districts um, who are very, very concerned about the delivery of healthcare or lack thereof right at this time. They're concerned, uh, there's a lot of worry out there and we need to do something, and we need to do it now. We cannot put anything off. We thought being having September the 30th was uh, an opportunity to give government um, a little bit of time to get their plan or their strategy in place. Um, however, they've had four years to do so. And uh, with the urgency that is um, present today, we had to move that date up. Islanders need to have some facts from this government. They need to know timelines of when they can, I, I guess, access um, health care services, no matter where they live. So, and especially in the emergency departments, I mean, in Western Prince Edward Island, where I come from, it has been an issue now for, for several years. The closures are more and more frequent we have, well, I guess I'm just going to say, like I said it yesterday, government has made so many announcements of closures that people now don't even read them anymore. It's just they've become used to it. So as I suggested yesterday, it may be, and I'm not even joking when I say this, just tell us when it's open so we'll know when to go there. Because that too is a risk of uh, residents in the area not knowing whether the air is open or it's closed and you have to go into Alberton to find the doors are closed. Ambulance response times are still not where they are, and it's definitely not uh, as a result of any of the staff, um, any of the paramedics. They are working above and beyond what is expected of them already. They are short-staffed. Um, but there are many, many times people uh, on the island, no matter where you live, have experienced long wait times, um, and then you're in Sea Cow Pond, like I mentioned yesterday, or Skinner's Pond. You're an hour and 10, hour and 15 minutes away from the closest ER that may be open in, uh, in uh, Summerside. So moving up this date to give them four weeks, give them four weeks to present a strategy to this assembly so that Islanders will have the comfort that they deserve to know that there is a plan in place, that there is um, at least some strategy to change the way things are, because it's, it's, it's not a good situation out there. On a daily basis, I could open my messenger, I could open my a, a text, mm -hmm. or um, my emails, um, voicemail. I will have messages from people all over this island concerned about the lack of access to health care. Emergency rooms are there for a particular reason, um, case of a tragedy, case of any kind of uh, trauma or health issue that requires immediate attention, emergency departments are there to help these individuals. The too frequent closures are not helping <laughs> the, the, the residents of, of my area, they're not helping the residents of, of Montague and outlying areas, for sure. It's putting a strain on the other ERs, uh, on, on uh, island hospitals. 
um, definitely, who are already experiencing long wait times. The ERs are, are um, the, the staff, they're overworked, they're overwhelmed, many are being burnt out. We have, I'm, even, they have to come up with a plan. So I'm going to talk about something in, in, at Western Hospital in, in Alberton. So right now they're down to 18 beds. They have the ER closed because it is, the CEC is closed, and the ER is closed too frequently because of staff shortages, primarily because of, of nursing shortages. So I know that there was a proposal put to Health PEI that if we were to, not we, meaning the hospital was to drop the number of beds, inpatient beds, to 15, then the ER would be able to be fully staffed and not have any closures. But that was turned down. So I'm not sure what the plan is for health PEI. I, I really have no idea what their plan is. The concern and the worry out there is that the intention is to, uh, I always said it was a slow erosion of services and eventually the closure of the hospital, but now I'm going to say that, that it's not even the slow erosion anymore. That is, things are happening so fast and things are happening without any public consultation. Uh, even staff don't even have any consultation or any heads up that changes are going to be made. And we talked about the ICU multiple times. Uh, I mean, here, and that's just one example of what can, what can happen. So I'm really, really concerned about um, the ER closures. I'm concerned about the health of my residents, my family, I'm concerned about Islanders' um, ability to access health care when required. We need to do something. This government needs to do something. They need to act immediately. Um, so we talk about health care workers um, right across the spectrum, such as doctors and, and uh, medical staff. They're critical in the functioning of the health care system, and they do not operate, they cannot operate, without having a full team. So in this motion that we had, we focus on concrete action and retention to keep our ERs open. There needs to be a concrete action, a plan in place, a strategy, so that we can keep those doors open so that when needed, Islanders have access to timely health care. And part of this is, is, well, I mentioned yesterday, Staff shortages, staff shortages, it's closed staff shortages. So we have to retain the staff that we already have and recruit new staff and to replace those that um, have left, unfortunately. So without retention, we experience staff shortages. We know what staff shortages equal. It means services are closed or not offered. It means ER shuts down in rural hospitals. That is a two common message that's been put out to the public, too common. It means the closure of the ICU at the uh, Prince County Hospital in Summerside. And what does that mean? It means an overwhelmed and overcapacity ER at the QEH. Also, it means uh, an overwhelmed and overcapacity at the ER at the Prince County Hospital in Summerside. What we need to do Madam Speaker, is to provide an environment that is welcoming to staff to stay. I'm trying to give the government some ideas of what, the, what they need, some, a little bit of input to help them get that strategy in place. We need an environment that retains healthy staff and that does not actually drive them away. So we need to do everything that we possibly can to give them the supports that they need so that they will stay here in Prince Edward Island. And retaining existing healthcare workers is essential because of the following reasons. Quality of care. Experienced healthcare workers deliver high quality care, which, impa which impacts patients' overall health and outcomes. And we cannot thank, we cannot thank the experienced healthcare workers that we have presently here on Prince Edward Island. And it's unfortunate that many ha experienced healthcare workers have left Prince Edward Island because they are basically burnt out is, is what they tell us. They're burnt out because they don't have the supports and the resources available. Uh, on a day-to-day
day basis uh, for the, to provide the service that Islanders deserve. And what the Islanders deserve is timely access to health care. Another reason is cost effective. The cost and time of recruiting, hiring, and training new workers can be more expensive than retraining existing or retaining sorry existing skilled staff here in Prince Edward Island. So retaining is very very important. Retaining exists. Uh, retaining the existing healthcare workers increases their familiarity with, with the facility in which they work and reduces the training cost and the patient care errors. I talked yesterday about uh, uh, physician ch uh, changes and how it affects um, those who have mental health issues who finally find the comfort of, of uh, being able to speak freely to their physician um, to be able to finally release some of the pressures and the anxieties that they have um, with that physician and then all of a sudden that's, the rug is basically pulled out from underneath their feet when that physician leaves and the physician is leaving because they do not have those supports and resources that are in place. So something needs to change. Something needs to change. I know we do exit surveys here on Prince Edward Island, but they're not mandatory. So mandatory exit survey, sur uh, surveys are a necessity to know why physicians, why nurses, why any healthcare worker is leaving <coughs> Prince Edward Island. If we don't know what the problem is, you can't fix it. The continuity of care. Long-standing healthcare workers develop long-term professional relationships with patients, which contributes to patient satisfaction and improved and improves health outcomes. I just mentioned about um, the mental health uh, concerns that I've heard multiple times at the door during the past election. That I've heard from uh, constituents who have contacted me. Um, that do not have access now to a family doctor. They, they do not feel comfortable in crowds, in the public, and the only way that they can even try to seek any kind of medical assistance right now is to go to an ER when it is open and sit there possibly for hours. And I'm not talking two to three hours. I'm taking, there are times where, where, where people are sitting there for at least 12 hours I've heard stories of uh, senior citizens uh, at the Western Hospital in Alberton where they've sat there, they, they, were, they were registered, they sat there, and then the lights were shut off. Everybody went home, left them in, in, in the room waiting. This cannot, cannot continue to happen here in Prince Edward Island. Our, our seniors, all of our residents of Prince Edward Island need to know that when they need health care, that is going to be provided in a timely fashion. A lot of times we hear, or not a lot of times we shouldn't hear, but you get on online, social media, even in here, we talk about disclosures, we talk about what we can do, and we talk about how it impacts and affects um, other departments and, and individuals, uh, communities, uh, right across Prince Edward Island. But we often don't talk about staff morale. And part of the retaining um, staff means that we have to create a positive work environment. Um, we need to, which would lead then to job satisfaction and people wanting to stay here. And it decreases burnout. And that goes from every, every <coughs> corner of a, of a hospital or any kind of medical facility here in Prince Edward Island. It increases employment or employee engagement within those uh, facilities. I've talked to many in the healthcare field that are just counting the days for retirement. Counting the days for retirement because of the toxic work environment that they are presently in, because they are understaffed, they're overwhelmed, and they're being burnt out. They need to know that this government cares, that this government has a plan to reduce those stresses and they need to know that they are valued for the great work they do. Our older staff members provide an opportunity for knowledge to be transferred to the younger uh, workers, which contributes to the overall quality of care over time. So it's great to, to, for these young graduates. Uh, yesterday we talked about 
the nursing graduates. Uh, so when they go into hospitals or or whatever uh, they choose in, within the uh, healthcare field, that they have a mentor who helps them along the way so that they are more prepared to the practical part um, within the hospitals, that they share their knowledge with the uh, younger workers um, to, I guess, make it a little bit easier for them to transfer into uh, the new workplace and also to give them that uh, assurance that they can, um, assurance that they know they have somebody to fall back on to if they have any questions within the hospital. And we need to retain a mix of our older staff and uh, to help these younger workers. So with so many of the older staff just counting the days of retirement, we need to be very, very creative in how to build up that morale, to show them that they're valued, to decrease the workload that they have now so that they don't, that doesn't result in continual, um, being continually overwhelmed um, in the workplace. We need, to, we need to keep them. So retention is huge to keep in our ERs open here on Prince Edward Island. Healthcare facilities that retain experienced healthcare workers create a sense of stability and consistency that can attract new places. And they can improve the organization's reputation and have a positive impact on health worker um, morale. When we talk about the closures at Western or Kings County Memorial, um, a lot of times the, we, we forget that there are staff in those facilities that are really taking on the extra load. They're working above and beyond what is asked from them to keep that facility open. And when we talk negative, negatively, and I have to always keep that in mind too, that it's when we met, mentioned the Western Hospital or Kings County or QEH or, or uh, uh, the Prince County Hospital, um, that we are talking about health PEI and their functioning and delivery of health um, to Islanders. Not about the staff that's in there because the staff go above and beyond to keep those doors open as much as they possibly can. I'd love to see Health PEI, I'd love to see this government have meetings with the frontline workers. Yes. The frontline workers live this on a day-to-day -day basis. They know the issues. Right from the front staff, when you walk in the doors to the receptionist, from there to uh, the janitorial staff, you talk RCWs, the LPNs, uh, the RNs, the physicians, uh, those in the lab, uh, anyone who works within the healthcare facility, speak to them. They live with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. They know them. They might be able to give you some insight as to what it's like in there in a day, so you have a little bit of a, a better understanding of what they're going through. Also, they may be able to give some advice, some direction to move forward instead of the constant stepping back that we're seeing nowadays. I mentioned earlier about the suggestion of the staff at the Western Hospital in Alberton. What they, what, what they suggested, what, what could be done to keep the doors open of the ER at Western to provide a service um, for the residents of West Prince. Didn't happen. It didn't happen. So what is that saying about staff morale? What is that saying about, about the, the importance of having uh, healthcare workers in a facility that are not felt like they have a voice or that they are appreciated? It really, really affects the overall morale within these facilities. It has an impact on the whole system. Government, health PEI need to start having a conversation with the frontline workers. Having someone maybe from a desk in Charlottetown make decisions about a hospital in rural Prince Edward Island without any consultation makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense. So what we're asking is that those who make these decisions visit these rural hospitals and the urban hospitals, speak to their frontline staff, 
let them freely tell you what the their concerns are. Take take a take a day. Walk in their shoes for a day. See what they see. See it from their perspective. I'm, I'm sure it will change their mind. You cannot make decisions in uh, about these facilities if you have never experienced it. So if you don't understand fully the impact of closures, the impact of understaffing has in, in hospitals and facilities across this, this island, and you're making decisions, that's the problem. That's the problem we see right there. There are individuals that are scared in my area about the closure of the Western Hospital. We've already seen the CEC close since last summer. Now we're seeing, again, the way too frequent announcements that the ER is closed uh, at the Western Hospital. I know the minister or the former minister of health has said that it will not close on his watch. Um, I'm not sure when that watch is over, if it was over when he was, uh, uh, could, it could be, I don't know, but it, 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 was it over when he is no longer the Minister of Health or when he is no longer the representative of the district in which the Western Hospital and that ER is situated? And even if it continues as long as that, that, that minister um, is elected, it still doesn't say what services will be offered at that hospital. It doesn't say that the ER will, will stay open. It just says that the Western Hospital the sign will be there. It doesn't mean that the services that uh, should be there are there. Mm -hmm. So we need to know, Islanders need to know, they need to know what the plan is for the future of the hospitals here on Prince Edward Island, both urban and rural. There is a huge outcry right now um, in, in my area ever since the um, announcement of the ICU in Summerside being closed. People are, are very, very um, scared because now Charlottetown is two hours and some places in my district two hours and 15 minutes away from, from Charlottetown. And that's scary. I talked yesterday about the ambulances and I mentioned it a while ago about the response time. Due to no fault of the paramedics, it's just they're caught up. The ERs in, in, in some of our, uh, Madam Speaker, this time I will adjourn debate. Honourable Member, do you have a seconder? Honourable Member, do you have a seconder? Oh, seconded by the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you. Uh, Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I seconded by the Leader of the Third Party. Order, that uh, order number nine now be called. To a carry. Motion number nine. The Leader of the Third Party moves, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park, the following motion. Whereas COVID-19 exposed serious challenges within our long-term care system on PEI, and whereas Islanders living in long-term care deserve to be safe and live with dignity. And whereas the federal government has developed national standards for long-term care. And whereas the provincial progressive conservative government announced the long-term care COVID-19 external review that would highlight changes which could be made to improve our long-term care system on, on PEI. And whereas to date, the national standards have not been legislated by the provincial government and the findings of the external review have not been shared with Islanders. And whereas these long-term care standards and report findings could positively affect the lives of every Islander living in long-term care and their implementation could be, should be a priority of government. Therefore be resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to legislate the national standards for long-term care. Therefore, be it further resolved, the Legislative Assembly urge government to immediately release the findings of the long-term care COVID-19 external review. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and speak to this incredibly important motion on the health and well-being of our senior citizens. It's no secret that we will have and we will continue to have significant growth in our elderly population. And accordingly, we need to, be, we need to ensure that the appropriate health care is available to meet their needs. 
we know that this can take an awful lot of forms. It could be home care, it could be assisted living, um, increased personal and health needs are of course very significant. This is a vulnerable population with complex needs. It could also be long-term care. Last year, the provincial government published the internal review of long-term care on Prince Edward Island. The report found that, and I quote, if PEI continues on its current path based on population and demographic projections, a 35% increase in the total number of long-term care beds will be required by 2025, that's just three years away, at an approximate capital cost of $134 million and additional annual operating costs of more than $30 million, a 35% increase over the next three years, and that's an internal government report. We had media reporting last year that said that more than 100 long-term care beds were unused, they were vacant, because there were simply not enough staff there to provide even minimal levels of care. So we're, we're in a bit of a familiar bind here. We, need, we, have the, we have the facilities, we have the bricks and mortar, we have what we need, except we don't have the staff. We need to increase our bed capacity for long-term care, of course we need to do that, and this report says we need to increase it by 35% over the next three years, but we can't do that unless we have staff on our facilities to provide the minimum level of care. And I should say here that the provincial minimum standards of care are even below the federal standards of care, and I'll get to that a little bit later. And this is leading to poorer outcomes for island seniors. Earlier this year, the CDC did some really fine reporting on the state of long-term care in Prince Edward Island. And it noted that multiple private care facilities were, were not meeting the provincial inspection standards for full licenses. I mentioned this in question period today. 70% of private long-term care facilities in the last year have not met the minimum standards. And among the issues flagged uh, in those 70% of long-term care facilities were the need to improve wound care policies and staff education, there are many others, but those two are, are things that, that I think are forefront in my mind at the moment. It's one thing to know that long-term care facilities are not meeting their standards and to be told that and to read it in a report, but it's a, an entirely other thing to see and understand that from a human point of view, because these failures of not meeting standards are impacting human beings, they're impacting our friends and our neighbours and islanders who live here and deserve to be treated with the same level of care and respect and healthcare services that we all are. The CBC spoke, for example, to the daughter of one of these patients in long-term care. According to CBC, she was worried, and again I quote, the staff were stretched too thin or insufficiently trained to properly care for her mother, who also had diabetes. And that's the end of the quote. The, the mother had developed a wound on her foot, it was about the size of a nickel. But it, it, it was persistent, it did not get better. And eventually, the family had to move their mother from a private care facility where she was and was not si simply not able, and this is not a condemnation of the staff there, there just were not enough of them and they did not have sufficient training to provide the care that this person needed. They moved their mother from a private facility to a public care facility. And as the CBC reported again in their story, and I quote the family said, we decided to move our mother to another home where the moon, when the wound, sorry, when the wound that had started out the size of a nickel grew, grew to become black necrotic flesh creeping up the back of her heel. Now, sadly, this woman died. She died from sepsis, septicemia, which is um, an infection of the entire bloodstream of, of, of the system. And, and, and the cause of that, according to the medical records, was sepsis due to a chronic wound. This untreated, manageable small problem became something, because of the lack of standards of care, to something that actually ended this woman's life. And I want to thank the family for coming forward and sharing this story, horrific though it is. And I also want to thank the other island families who came forward with their stories about a year and a half ago when the Greens were calling for a public inquiry into long-term care. There, there are really very real consequences when we fail to ensure adequate standards of health care uh, for islanders. It's, it's quite literally a life or death matter and it's not acceptable. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, in particular, highlighted the need to improve our standards of care in our health care system. And indeed, many of our COVID deaths 
were related to long-term care and long-term care facilities, and island seniors lived in fear as, as outbreaks were reported across this country and indeed spread through our healthcare facilities here on Prince Edward Island laterally. And some of which were, these homes are just simply not set up well to prevent and manage outbreaks of communicable diseases like COVID-19. Andre Picard wrote in his book, Neglected No More, which was spurred on by um, the COVID pandemic and how it exposed um, systemic neglect of our elders, particularly in long-term care uh, facilities. Um, it's a really damning book of how Canada has institutionalized the care of our elders, how they are over-medicated, how there is physical and emotional abuse regularly, there's inadequate personal care, not sufficient frequency of bathing and things like that, like, like basic stuff, basic, basic stuff that every human being should imagine that they, are, they, they should have access to. It's a really damning book, and, and he talks about how we absolutely have to address this institutionalization of our elders and, and how we can better meet these complex needs of this very vulnerable population. I would encourage all of you to read it. it it's not only a condemnation of the system that we have here in Canada, but it provides some very helpful ideas on how we might move to a different sort of system, or a differently balanced system, which, which exists in many other jurisdictions. Here in Canada, following uh, COVID, there was a recognition uh, of that need to improve long-term care, and two things happened. One thing was at the provincial level, where the government commissioned an external review. We called for a public inquiry. This government decided to do an external review, and that was talked about earlier today. It was promised last fall and then this spring, and we still have not seen it. And unfortunately, of course, the, the, the report, as far as we know, is not, is not published, and it's really hard to assess what benefit islanders and their families are going to receive from this work. And as I urged the minister during question period today, in fact, I think it was my honourable colleague from Victoria Park, uh, Charlottetown, Vic Victoria Park, we really urge you to release this document, because the longer it sits on the table, the less useful it is for us to learn from our mistakes and be able to improve the situation for our island seniors. And that's what happened at a provincial level, which is basically nothing, of course, because we haven't got this report. The other thing that happened was at the federal level. Um, earlier this year, national standards for long-term care facilities were released. And in a joint statement, the Federal Minister of Health and the Federal Minister of Seniors said this, and again, I quote from the report. Together, these standards provide guidance for delivering services that are safe, reliable, and most importantly, centered on residents' needs. And they're talking here of residents of long-term care facilities. They aim to foster a healthy and competent workforce, create safer physical environments, and promote a culture of quality improvement and learning across LTC homes. Now, again, in question period today, my colleague from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, asked when this government was going to implement these currently not mandatory suggestions, these, um, these standards of care. And we got a response that basically suggests that there's, they're in no hurry to do this. And that's really disappointing. We know things are not good. We know that the health of island seniors is suffering. In some cases, their deaths are hastened by the lack of care that we, we are seeing in our long-term care facilities. So why not make these national standards of care appropriate and mandated and obligatory here in our province right now. I think all of these outcomes that we'd like to see are, are appropriate here for PEI, and I, I urge the government to legislate these federal standards so to, to help ensure that we are delivering the best care possible to our island seniors. I also urge members of this House to support this motion. Our seniors will thank us for it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you for the words from the leader of the third party. After hearing his words, I'm not sure how we're not all outraged in here. And I know we're not outraged because we have a report that's been promised again and again and again that's still sitting there. When we had numerous committee meetings on this and nothing has been done. We know what the issues are, and nothing has been done. 
So we can stand in here and say all we want how outraged we are, but our actions speak louder than that. This report apparently now sits with Executive Council. It's not even with Health and Wellness anymore. So how is a department who is charged with long-term care facilities, how are they supposed to do their job when they have absolutely no control over that? Which makes me ask, why does it sit with Executive Council? Do we have something to hide here? A lot of questions. Ever since becoming an MLA, the Greens have consistently heard from concerned families of long-term care residents and health care workers. These concerns grew in number and severity throughout the COVID pandemic and continue to this day. Family members and staff are worried and scared for both the safety of their loved one their, and other residents and workers. Unfortunately, this government has taken little to no responsibility to date for the safety and care of island residents in long-term care facilities. As we mentioned in question period earlier today, the CBC reported 70% of private homes in Prince Edward Island have failed inspections at one point or another within the past year. Why is that acceptable to this government? Why is there not, you know, I failed grade 12 algebra. Not that I'm comparing those two things in severity, but when we look at consequences, I failed grade 12 algebra. That haunted me throughout my post-secondary career. Couldn't get into certain programs because I failed grade 12 algebra, but it had nothing to do with what I was doing. So there are no consequences here for a government who's not taking responsibility for this. Seniors are getting very sick and dying needlessly of things that can be prevented and cared for. These are not just numbers we are talking about. When we say that 70% of long-term care homes have failed inspections at one point or another, we're talking about people who are living in 70% of these failed inspections. Their lives we're talking about. Seniors are some of our most vulnerable islanders. They deserve safety and dignity. Is this really the best care we can provide them? Really? Last summer, our office heard from many families who were devastated by the conditions their loved ones were experiencing in long-term care. One family member shared the story with us that their loved one's eyelid, she was, they were so dehydrated that their eyelid was stuck to their eyeball and they could not blink. Dehydration, are we okay with that? Are we okay with staff being so burdened that they can't? give a senior water? Is that where we are? Yep, it is where we are. Another shared stories of her mother being left in soiled diapers overnight with no assistance offered to get to the washroom. Talk about not valuing a person's dignity and let me tell you how many stories we heard about island seniors sitting in their own urine and feces for hours at a time, not being bathed for weeks at a time. That is what we are experiencing right now in long-term care in Prince Edward Island. And we cannot kid ourselves, sitting there thinking I'm over-exaggerating, go talk to family members and see, see what the truth is. Our caucus called for a public inquiry into long-term care to ensure that a truly public process, to ensure people conducting the inquiry would have access to all the resources they needed. Why wouldn't we all have wanted this? If we are truly committed to making this better, why would we not have wanted this? Why do we need to keep control of what is happening in these facilities? It, ser it only serves government, that's it. It doesn't serve the people who are living in these facilities, nor their loved ones who are watching this happen. The best the Premier said he could do was an external review, and we still don't have that. It's supposed to come to us in the fall of 2022, the winter of 2023, and now we hear soon. Unacceptable. For those of you who are new in this Legislative Assembly, may not be aware that we, this was something that we studied in our Health and Social Development Committee, where I sat through that meeting and bit my tongue the whole time, 
when I would hear stories about seniors being left in long-term care facilities in their own feces and urine for hours at a time, not bathing for weeks at a time, and then had the nerve to hear governments say that we are meeting minimum standards of care. Excuse me? How can those two things exist at the same time? Seriously, if we are okay with calling that a minimum standard of care, we should be more than ashamed of ourselves. We do not deserve to sit in these seats. So next, looking at um, the COVID report, the, um, whenever we think of the, the findings that we tabled this morning, mistakes were made and challenges were exposed. And I, for one, as a human being and a lifelong learner, like to see where I went wrong I like to know the mistakes I made. Is it always easy to hear? Nope. It's never easy to hear. Sometimes it is, but most times it is not. But as a human being who's committed to being a lifelong learner, I want to learn from my mistakes, and I would like to think that governments like to do the same. If we don't learn from these mistakes, we will never improve the care that we, have, we are giving islanders right now. We can't learn if we don't know what we need to do better. What's the point of improving something if we don't even know that that's what needs to be improved? Islanders also deserve to know that government is taking this work seriously. So in our motion, we call for the standards of care to be legislated. So why, why is that important? Why do we need that? If what I said already wasn't convincing enough, um, currently we have very few standards and we have 70% of private homes failing inspections but continuing to operate with no consequences or support. And I say this knowing full well how inequitable the funding models are between public and private. How inequitable the inspection processes are between public and private. And what's funny to me is if you are in a private long-term care facility, if you run a private long-term care facility, you are inspected, you have surprise inspections, you are inspected at least on a yearly basis. I might be, I stand to be correct on that, could be shorter. Um, and you're then left to, to figure that out once you get your report back. If you are the government, you are peer, review, peer reviewed every seven years, I might have my number wrong there, peer reviewed, and there's no surprise inspections. So based on that, I would love to pop in sometime to a public, um, a public long-term care facility and a private one, because I bet you those two standards are very different things. So along with the two things we're calling for, if we don't look at our funding models, if we don't look at our inspection models, why are we even here? Enshrining the national standards in law would ensure that our seniors have clear standard, a clear standard of care to expect and a higher standard of care that our nursing home regulators can enforce. We need this to be our baseline because if it's not, our minimum standards of care, which we seem to think are okay in PEI, means that we are okay with, we are fine with, seniors sitting in their own urine and feces for hours at a time, not bathing for weeks at a time. That's what that means if we don't enshrine these in legislation. And I hope that everyone can hear me say that. If you haven't noticed, this is something that I've invested a lot of time and interest in since becoming an MLA because I find it shocking. The more you learn, the more you, you know. And if you're okay with, with this level, the standard of care, then you're fine to sit there comfortably, but I hope you're uncomfortable because that means that maybe it will lead to some change. And I really, truly look forward to others' comments on this very important part of our health care system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and it's a, it's a pleasure to rise to this very important and good motion. I think it's um, fantastic, and I think it's one that um, is, is very, very crucially important to our province. I sat on the same committee as the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, and we went through a lot of difficult, difficult meetings. And if you didn't feel something after those meetings for um, the, the, the people who were trying to live in long-term care, um, it, it was incredible. And not to have a, a report released that can help, uh, help us out. We were talking about that a year ago. I, an absolute year ago, 
and, and trying to push for that then. This report needs to be released. Um, we, need to, we need to follow the basic standards, and that, that's, that's what we're asking for. It's, it's almost embarrassing that we, we have gotten to this stage where we're just, where we're asking for the minimum. I didn't think they could fall below that, but they have. And you know what else, um, a difficult situation, long-term care facilities, and anybody in this house that was in there uh, to a long-term care facility, they went through, if we went through a lot with COVID, you went through more in long-term care. You went through way more in there because they weren't allowed to interact with people they had to stay they were they were they were told to stay for their own safety in the areas that they were that, that they were supposed to stay in visitors were restricted it was a difficult time it was a difficult time and what's funny is that during the election when when covid was done for us it was it was done we were able to go door to door we weren't always able to say we were able to go door to door um, um, during our, our four years. We were able to go door to door. We felt free to do that. Go into a long-term care facilities and they had different rules in there still in, in this year. That is difficult. That is difficult. And that became one of the things that they asked for. The people in long-term care facilities asked for. And that, that's, that's difficult. Since then, you go in now, things are starting to change. It feels better in there. There's an esprit in there. In my own district, I have Beach Grove Home, I have PE Home, and I have Garden Home. And I spend a lot of time in those facilities. And the staff work incredibly hard. There's not one minute you can go where somebody's not cleaning, fixing, doing something, um, um, caring for, for one another. The problem is there's no staff. There's no staff, and staff has, haven't been uh, recruited accurately for these, for these three different locations. And two of them are public. Two of them are public. And looking at Health PEI's numbers, the occupancy rate from 2020 to 2022 in long-term care facilities has dropped, has dropped. But there's a wait list. It's at 93%. It was at 98% in 2020. Now it's at 93%. I wonder what it is this year. We're losing beds because we can't staff. It doesn't make sense, and we have a massive wait list on the other end. So I'm glad you brought up long-term care today because it remains crucial. People in long-term care facilities in 2020 stayed for an average of 3.3 years. Now they're staying for an average of 3.6 years. Less beds, longer stays, bigger wait lists, and yet we're looking at standards of we're, we're looking at standards, and we're not. We don't have a full court press on to fix fix them. The total number of admissions in long-term care in 2020 was 135. The number of long-term care beds in 2022, and this is Health PEI's numbers, was 622. We need more beds. We need more staff. We need more energy. We need more motivation. We need, we need that report to be finished, and we need to do better to make sure we're there. When, when, when Beach Grove Home, when I have a nursing staff Come, come to me as the MLA and say, hey, will you fundraise, help me fundraise for a project, and, and we're going to, the community's gonna fundraise. This isn't a public facility, okay? And if you look at Beach Grove Home, it was built way, way back in, in, I don't know, maybe 1970, 72, 73, I don't know the numbers, back. It's old. Wheelchairs are bigger now, okay? Do you know what they're, do you know what they're fundraising for? Do you know what they're fundraising? They're fundraising so the door to the courtyard can be expanded. That's what they're fundraising for, in your buildings, in your government buildings. And I said, yes, I'll help fundraise, but why are we not looking at that? Why are we not looking at this simple issue to expand the door? Can we not expand the door so people can go outside? They're, a nurse is gonna head a fundraising committee for this? It doesn't make sense. And that's just one issue outside of uh, uh, common standards. Prince Edward home. What's their biggest concern? The internet does not work. The internet does not work during COVID and up to now. You cannot get internet services from your government to fix, to, to make sure that somebody can have proper access to, to, being, to being in a Prince Edward home. That was the number one thing by staff and, and patients and people living there. So it's little things like that. We can start right away. 
and I know the former Minister of Economic Growth and maybe the new one can take that and write that down because I want that to be fixed and I won't stop till it's fixed. They deserve that and your government needs to do it quickly. So it's little things like this. It's little things that, that, that we need to look at long-term care and how we approach it. And it's not just a matter of um, looking at it from the, from the perimeter. We have to dig in, we have to fund, and we have to make this better. Because in PEI, the, the, the standards in there are not, not good, both in private and public. So I, I am going to, and I hope every member in this legislature looks at this motion seriously, because it sends a message that this is important to each and every one of our constituents. That's our, those are our families, and they're in there for 3.6 years. So whatever we can do, whatever I can do to support your motion, I will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Speaker. The Honourable uh, Minister of Health and Wellness, can, can we have the podium, please? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for this motion. Our long-term care system is a vital part of health care in Prince Edward Island. This is a responsibility that we take very seriously. We were pleased to see two sets of national standards of long-term care announced earlier. Our department is in the process of reviewing these standards against our Community Care Facilities and Nursing Home, Nursing Home Act and Community Care Facilities and Nursing Home Act regulations as well as our inspection standards. It is our intent to update our act and regulations. Our future LTC, LTC system will be informed and strengthened by these standards, as well as the results of the external panel review of long-term care in the light of COVID-19. Our goal is to provide the best care possible for Islanders in need of care. Across Canada, the pandemic experience exposed long-term care homes as an area of vulnerability in the health care system. We know that. We are determined to address that vulnerability and initiate it the external panel review. The review panel is in the process of drafting their report based on data from surveys, stakeholder interviews, submissions, and public consultations to identify areas of strength and areas of improvement. The aim of this work is to identify and implement measures to ensure that the long-term care sector is prepared to meet future infectious disease threats and others. It is anticipated that the review report will be submitted to government in the coming months and I eagerly await its findings. It is not complete. The department, along with the key stakeholders, will use this report and the new national long-term care standards to guide the development of a plan for this sector. It is important that we collaborate and guide the facilities that care for our beloved seniors. Private long-term care providers are important contributors to our health system and provide health care and accommodations for many Islanders in their seniors, senior years. We will work to uphold and enhance standards and foster excellence in this vital industry in both the public and private sector. I want to note that there are investments happening in long-term care. We were recently able to use the Safe Long-Term Care Restart Fund to purchase equipment, improve infrastructure, and invest in, infe in infection prevention and control measures in long-term care homes. Over the past decade, more than 200 permanent long-term care beds have been opened. An additional 36 private long-term care homes in Prince County are slated to operationalize by the end of 2023 2024 fiscal year. Though human health, human, though health human resource challenges have resulted in restrictions in the number of beds available for admission, the volume of Islanders awaiting placement has remained sim similar over the past year. It is in the range of about 170 to 177, uh, if, my number, if my memory serves me correctly. We are finding spaces for Islanders who need care 
but accommodating the people who need spaces remains a challenge for us. It's important that we keep working to increase the spaces available in PEI's LTC system. This is a time of challenge and opportunity for the long-term sector. We want to work with these providers because the people providing care want to deliver quality care for people in their homes. In our experience, homes make every effort to address compliance issues that have been identified during a license review as soon as possible. We work with those homes to make that happen. We are confident that government and private providers will continue to enhance and improve the care we provide to Islanders who depend on us. Madam Speaker, with that intent, with that I intend to support this motion, but to do so, I need to amend the legislative operating costs to reflect that these standards are entrusted in regulation. So, Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that Motion 9 be amended by removing the word legislate in the first operative clause and replaced with the word adopt. Honourable Minister, do you have copies of the amendment? Okay, honorable members, we all have copies of the amendment to the motion. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to the amendment? Okay, I'll call the question. All those. In oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, honorable member, uh, leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm, I'm just taking a moment to reflect on the, the difference that this will make in the first operative clause. And. Uh, I appreciate the Minister's comments, by the way, to the, the motion. I thank him for standing up and, re and responding to this. And the difference, I, I think, as I understand this in not legislating, uh, but rather adopting, um, would be to adopt them in the regulations. I suspect that's what you mean. And that, that of course, has force in law as well, and I'd be perfectly happy if that is indeed what the, this is the power of the executive branch of government to do. In fact, it would be a lot quicker in many respects to do that than it would be to try and pass a piece of legislation in this House. So um, I'm, I'm happy um, as long as this specifically re refers to these being adopted in regulation. And I, I don't see that. Um, I perhaps a, just a verbal uh, assurance from the minister that that is indeed what he means by this amendment. Um, and I will be happy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay. Is there anyone else to speak to the amendment? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying yay. 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 All those against the amendment signify, signify by saying nay. Okay, the amendment has carried, and we'll go back to the uh, motion at hand. And uh, is there anyone else to speak to the motion? Okay. Call the question on the motion. Um, yeah, sorry. Yes, Honourable Member. 
leader of the third party, to close debate. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I believe this will be the first motion in this uh, session, this assembly, to come to a vote, and I, I appreciate that. One of the joys of, of this House is that we have opportunities um, for members from all sides of the House to be given uh, an issue, to reflect on that issue and be given the opportunity to speak on behalf of their constituents um, if they have any concerns or support it, don't support it, wish to amend it, as the Minister just did. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's one, again, it's, it's one of the pleasures of being in this House that we are able to do this. I want to thank the members who spoke to this motion. I thank the Minister for his remarks and his assurance that this, I think he opened his remarks by saying that long-term care is a critical part, a vital part of our health care system. And I, I absolutely agree with that. And because it's such a vital part of our health care system, providing and meeting the needs of a very vulnerable population with, with often complex health care needs, um, it needs to be managed and supported and funded properly. And uh, adoption of regulations that reflect the national standards is something that can do that. So I thank the Minister for, um, for the amendment. I, I thank the, the other members who spoke um, encouragingly to this motion, and I look forward to the vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. Um, everyone ready for the question? All those in favour of the motion signify by saying yay. Yay. All those opposed, nay. Honourable Member, your motion has carried. Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Madam Speaker, I move that motion number, sorry, let me start that again. I move seconded by the leader of the third party that order number 14 be now called. Shall it carry? Motion number 14. The member for Charlottetown Victoria Parks moves, seconded by the leader of the third party, the following motion. Whereas many tenants have difficulties understanding their rights and obligations under tenancy laws. And whereas the Residential <coughs> Tenancy Act is more complex than its predecessor, pre predecessor legislation, and no community guides are available to assist tenants with its interpretations. <coughs> and whereas island tenants are increasingly subject to proceedings before IRAC, particularly when it comes to rent increases. And whereas tenants, who are more likely to be lower income often do not have the financial means to obtain advice or representation services, placing them at greater risk of negative consequences like rent increases or displacement. And whereas having access to a person trained to provide advice and representation would help island tenants assert their right to housing. Therefore, be it resolved, let the Legislative Assembly urge government to establish a tenant advocate to assist islanders with tenancy matters. <coughs> The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I think I've, I've learned a lot uh, since being elected back in 2019. And um, in case you didn't notice during my last chat, I love to learn and would be in school forever if, if I could afford it. Um, but one of the things that I learned, yeah, algebra, one of the things that I learned very quickly, and where I learned, where I recognized very quickly where some of my own weaknesses lie, was in the new Residential Tenancy Act. Holy cow, that was a complicated piece of legislation. And being the critic responsible for that piece of legislation, I can honestly say was probably, other than the frustrations I deal with on a daily basis, would have been the most challenging piece of work that I had to try to wrap my head around. Tenancy legislation is complicated, it's comprehensive, and it is complex. And so, and that is coming from someone who, you know, can navigate things pretty well. And when I don't understand something, I know where to go to, to get support to understand it. And it was still very challenging. And still to this day, you know, that areas you could improve, <laughs> spending more time on, on that tenancy legislation because it's important and it affects so many islanders. And we know that tenancy legislation is, you know, tenants knowing their rights, knowing their responsibilities in housing. If we're thinking about this piece of legislation which governs their rights and responsibilities, it is really, really 
challenging and complex. And given that um, we just passed this new piece of legislation, we all, I can't, I mean, I feel like saying raise your hand if you never got a call about housing before because holy cow, I'm not sure which province you live in if, if, you, could, if you could say that. Um, because I get, in our office, we get calls on a very regular basis for people who are dealing with illegal rent increases and don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. And even given with this new legislation, their you know, community legal information is such a wonderful resource on this island, and we do not fund them enough, and we have not supported them in, I, I know that they've developed some new pamphlets. I would love to know government's involvement in in how that came to be because we need to be supporting our community organizations because they are the ones who are helping people fall through the cracks. We're not the ones who are helping them. And when we do not prepare community organizations with the knowledge, with the tools and resources that they need to help Islanders, that's on us in here. When I think about the people who are most impacted by these rent increases and have to go through the process of appealing. And before I jump into that group, has anyone ever tried to help someone through an IRAC appeal for an illegal rent increase? Holy cow, these documents can be up to 300 pages of legal jargon that we expect seniors, um, families, people who are well-educated, people who are not well-educated, it doesn't matter. Everyone on that spectrum of being a human being is expected to do the same thing which is to read through each and every word of that document. And whatever you don't refute, if there's something you don't understand, I mean, you have a very short period of time to get through 300 pages, but you know, in some places you might just skim and think, ah, if I miss a word, it's no big deal, but this is a big deal. Because anything that you don't refute is taken as agreement. So you have to go through that with a fine-toothed comb. We have been asking government to provide a tenant support worker to help tenants do this process. And I am not sure why the heels dug in. I went through this whole speech throne looking just for that. That was all I was looking for in this one particular instance. Couldn't find it. You want to talk about an issue to access to justice? You want to talk a government who thinks access to justice is important? Well, here's a really good way to prove that. Because what we are expecting people to do is not humane. And do you know what the consequences are right now of not filing an appeal? Homelessness. That is a consequence, a very real consequence. And I can tell you, by and large, the people that I'm hearing from are seniors. People who are on fixed incomes, who don't have the energy, the time, the know-how to navigate all of this. And shame on us for not listening to them. You all know it over there. Hear it all the time. We've been talking about this since 2019, increasingly so, too, since 2019. Because this issue's only gotten worse. And let me tell you one thing. It's going to continue to get worse. So we don't think it worthy to support Islanders, seniors, who are having to go through 300 pages of legal jargon? I couldn't do that by myself. I'm an educated person. Who knows the resources? Like I said before, I would have a hard time doing yet that. So where do they go? You know, they'll go to community legal information. Well, guess what? That's not a government organization. Why? I mean, yes, community organizations are there to pick up the pieces, thank goodness, because as I mentioned before, they're the ones who are catching people for falling through the cracks. Without them, we would be hard pressed to catch those islanders. And yet we are perfectly fine with saying, oh, to go to community legal information, they can help you. Go to PEI Fight for Affordable Housing, they can, they can help you. How are we helping them? This is our legislation that we are expecting them to help islanders with. They see all this complication. I bet you they're wondering what you're doing to support islanders. As we consider the fact that this is a very complex piece of legislation and that it does take some time and energy to go through this, um, you know, this is even more complicated than the last one. There's no additional community resources at all. And people didn't understand the one before, and yet we're piling another one on top of them. 
these changes were necessary and they were good. Why don't we want to shout that from the rooftop? Why don't we want to look at this and say, hmm, do you know I've had islanders ask me if government may have tipped off landlords and that's why there were so many illegal rent increases coming in? I don't know the answer to that question. I would hope I know the answer to that question, but I don't. At the current moment, when government knows the issues and is not stepping up to fill those gaps, to support community organizations, to support individuals who are going through this, the scales are balanced in the favor of the landlord. We need to foster healthy relationships between landlords and tenants. And I can tell you the way in which this government is operating, it's doing nothing but driving wedges between the two and making things more complicated and pitting them against one another. That is what government policy often does. You know, if we consider something like the population growth strategy, and we want to think that that has nothing to do with um, hearing things concerning racism in our community. When we do something like have an aggressive population growth strategy that, by the way, has no checks or balances to say, oh my goodness, we've got how many thousands, 20, oh, almost 30,000 people on a uh, registry waiting for a doctor, but we're going to keep, we're going to keep you know, come on in, come on in. Is there, there's no point that makes us go, oh my goodness, whoa, whoa. There's no checks and balance with housing, with healthcare, with education. We are allowing it to just run rampant. And now we are facing these crises everywhere. <laughs> Government policy matters. It matters a whole heck of a lot. And it matters in ways that you don't e can't even imagine if you're not a person who kind of looks at things as a big picture which can be a curse sometimes because you see connections to the tangliest forms. Um, in order to make sure that we're not balancing or favoring, you know, the sides that, that when we talk about the scales not being balanced and that tipping right now in landlords' favor, we need to make sure that we protect the right to housing by ensuring tenants have adequate representation when their housing is at risk. I was down at the Community Outreach Centre the other day and I was chatting with them there and they were saying that they expect that um, they will see upwards to 100 more people this summer um, accessing those services. And we know that a, a large bulk of the people accessing services there are people who are unhoused. We're already seeing, last Thursday, um, the mayor hosted a conversation on supporting the unhoused community. I know a couple of members in here were there. And what a wonderful start of a discussion. And while it was glaringly obvious the fact that there were no unhoused islanders there, um, the attempt was to create a safe space to start having conversations. And with that, Madam Speaker, I will adjourn debate seconded by the leader of the third party. Thank you, Honourable Member. <coughs> Orders of the day government. Government motions. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that uh, order number one of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order number one, consideration of the speech of Her Honour the Lieutenant Governor at the opening of the present session and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Yes. Our leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I spent some time yesterday speaking at a high level about the throne speech, um, but focusing largely on health care. And today, again, in question period, it was dominated by uh, questions regarding health care. Uh, once more, the situation at the Prince County Hospital and the loss of internal medicine specialists and the cascading effect that has had on that institution and others who were picking up the slack um, was debated and, and also long-term care, both in question period and, and in a motion here. And rarely does a day go by where I, and I suspect that's, that this is true for every member in this legislature, uh, do not receive calls or texts or emails or 
letters from people uh, with healthcare concerns. And, and today was no different for me. I, I, I got an email from a constituent, uh, and it was, a, it, was, it was a different sort of approach, a different perspective on the healthcare problems from what, what I usually get. Most times it's somebody with an individual problem or a member of their family who is having difficulty accessing medicine, or, or often it's a, it's a healthcare worker themselves who will come to me. But in this case, it was somebody who, who asked the question in the, in the heading of the uh, email. It said, uh, what is wrong with our healthcare system? Which is, a, you know, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. And, and they went on in their email to express very eloquently, I might say, things that, that they were concerned about. This wasn't so much from a personal level of them not being able to access services, and they're not a healthcare worker. Um, but they, they said things like, you know, the problems seem to be accelerating at, at an exponential level every week. And they're, they're witnessing, and I'll use their words, a meltdown in the system that is now making it basically impossible to function and provide healthcare services to islanders. And they went on to talk about a whole bunch of things that they thought were wrong, and, and I sent them what I thought, I hope, is a, a, a useful response. But one of the things they focused on was the administrative burdens that uh, primary care physicians and nurse practitioners uh, are faced with. And we know that we've adopted uh, an electronic health record system here on Prince Edward Island. Um, it's a system which has not been tried in any other jurisdiction. And by all accounts, it's causing, uh, causing some consternation for those who have to use it. Uh, it's actually increasing the amount of time that doctors and nurse practitioners have to spend on clerical work, which of course means they have less time to spend on doing what they want to do and what they are trained to do, which is treating patients. And one of the things that this person suggested was, well, why, why don't we have help for that clerical work that, is, that comes with this new system, which is not working terribly well? And indeed, that was one of the suggestions in our Green Party platform, was to provide an administrative assistant for every doctor or MP who wanted it. And I think that is one of the small but not insignificant measures that would allow our healthcare professionals to do the jobs that they want and need to do. Um, this person supports the QEH Foundation. And one of the questions, the rhetorical questions in their email was, you know, I, I, I like supporting the QEH Foundation and it, it's really important that we buy the, the equipment that, that we do. But what is the point if we don't have the staff to operate that, and we talked a bit about that today with the, the long-term care situation where we have hundreds of empty beds. Uh, not because there isn't any need, my goodness, there is a huge need, but we just simply do not have the staff to operate them, and that's, and that's true across the healthcare system. Um, so when you see people like that, thoughtful people who are concerned not for their own particular health needs or their well-being, but for a system that appears to them to be um, to be on, in meltdown, as I said earlier, you get a sense of just how worried and concerned islanders are about a system on which we all depend um, at some point or another. One of the things that I think is fundamental, and I wrote this in my response to them, was that the management system of health of healthcare here on Prince Edward Island has to change. We need to amend the Health Services Act. And this is something that goes back to 2018. I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, I think. Uh, when the, at that time, Liberal administration made some significant changes to the Health Services Act, which reduced the authority of Health PEI to operate a, a truly at arm's length and, and to make decisions without political interference. And the whole board of Health PEI at that time resigned en masse in protest. Four years later, um, Derek Key, the most recent chair of Health PEI until Diane came along, um, resigned in December of last year for exactly the same reasons. Um, he could not tolerate any more the political interference in he and his board doing, trying to do their job. And for me, a fundamental thing, if we, not, if we do not get the administration and management of the healthcare system arranged properly, 
giving clear responsibility and authority where it, is, where it should be, and that typically in a jurisdiction lies with the independent health authority, in our case, Health PEI. We're lucky because we only have one health authority for the whole island. Some other places have far more complex, in fact, almost every other jurisdiction in Canada has far more complex uh, structures than we do here. We should be able to do this easily, like so many other things on PEI, we're a small jurisdiction and we should be nimble when we do things like this, but somehow we get bogged down in bureaucracy and, and until we fix the fundamental management administrative systems in health PEI, in the health system, uh, we are never going to run the smartest, most efficient, most effective healthcare system that we could. And, th and that's a huge problem, and I, and I wrote that in reply to the person who sent, sent their note. So the, there are many things that we could do to improve our, long, our, our healthcare system. And one thing which almost got no mention, and I, I think I talked about this when we were discussing the motion earlier this afternoon, long-term care was almost not mentioned at all in the throne speech. Um, the minister himself said in response to our motion today that, that long-term care is a vital part of our healthcare system, and he's absolutely right. Um, it is a vital part of our healthcare system. It supplies the needs of a very vulnerable population, a growing population, a population with complex health needs. And it's strange that given the problems that we know we have, and I know this report has not been made public yet, although it was being, it's been promised many, many times, so we sort of get used to that with this government. Even though we haven't seen this report, we know that there are problems. So if this is a vital part of our healthcare system, and we concede that there are serious problems in its operation and in its funding and in its support, then how can we in good conscience not even mention it in our throne speech or do something about it? Um, I'm very concerned about the absence of commitments to supporting long-term care here in Prince Edward Island. And, you know, I've already spoken at fair length this afternoon about it in the motion. So I'm not going to dwell on that. But I, I, I'm, part of me is um, uplifted by what the minister said and the adoption of the national standards. That's really important. But of course, there's no time frame associated with that. That could happen outside the next four years, the, ne the life of this administration. I obviously hope that's not the case. But um, I'm looking forward to the report being made public. Again, the, the minister, I think, in his remarks during the debate on the motion said, within the next few months. That doesn't fill me with optimism either. Um, this is a report that would have been, well, I mean, if it's in the next few months, that means it's going to be likely a year overdue. And it was only a year ago that we asked for this report. So it's taken twice as long on a critical issue, a time-sensitive issue. Um, and that, again, doesn't fill me with confidence. But you know what? It's a new minister new leadership in the department, and um, I'm willing to cut him a little bit of slack, and I hope that when he says that they're going to adopt the national standards and that this report is going to come forward in the next few months, I hope that's next month. I hope it's next week, actually, because there's really no excuse for further inaction on this file. Another critical healthcare aspect, which was almost unmentioned in the throne speech, is mental health. Now, all of us, again, I, 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 I'd be shocked if members of this assembly do not receive regular communication with their constituents um, on mental health issues, often heartbreaking mental health issues. And that can range from the, uh, the small and manageable to the to suicidal ideation and in, indeed suicide. And I can tell you over the eight years of my uh, time in this chair that some of the most heartbreaking and emotional and profoundly disturbing things I have dealt with relate to mental health. And it's not getting better. Four years ago, the Premier ran in 2019 on a platform that was really dedicated to overhauling mental health here on Prince Edward Island. And you know they promised a, a mental health hospital. Um, there was a real focus in response to public outcries and, and, and real challenges in our society, in our communities, for people struggling with mental health issues. 
It's shocking to me that four years later, mental health is essentially not mentioned. The only mention about mental health here um, is what the people who are homeless. People who, who and I, I don't know the exact quote, but it, it's certainly related to people living with homelessness or home insecurity and, and their need for mental health and addiction services. So talk, firstly, talk about stigmatization of a part of our community, but also the fact that that's the only reference to mental health in the whole throne speech tells me that either uh, this premier feels the, sol the problem is solved and that he's moved on, or that this is another example of neglect by this government, an issue which seized them four years ago and now they seem not to care about it at all. And that's a terrible disservice to thousands of islanders who are suffering daily from, again, the wide range of mental health challenges that, that are almost every family, including my own, has been struck with over the years. Thank you. Included in that lack of mention of mental health is the Mental Health Act and a review of that act. And that's something that was promised by the previous government in the previous assembly. I really hope, I haven't seen it on the list of legislation which is coming forward. I know that's not quite complete yet as far as I'm aware. But unless we get a substantive meaningful review of the Mental Health Act, we are going to be decades behind. We already are decades behind other provinces in terms of what modern mental health legislation looks like. And without a modern mental health act, we are not providing the services, we are not providing the safety and the security and, and the support to, again, the tens of thousands of islanders who are suffering from mental health challenges. So I really hope that the absence of mental health or even almost any mention of it in this throne speech is not indicative that this government does not care about that issue because my goodness, it's a concern for so many of us, so many of our constituents, so many of people in our families, so many people in our communities and we have to do something about it, something meaningful. We've spoken a lot about healthcare, but I was almost relieved to hear other topics come up in discussion in this house. And my honorable friend, the member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park, just introduced, spoke for a few minutes on a motion regarding housing. Housing, of course, is one of those other wicked problems I refer to them sometimes as because they're complex, they're large, there are no easy solutions. They require both government action and support and funding and working with the private sector. And there is a full spectrum of housing needs in our community. And one of those areas where government has complete control is the amount of money that we devote to public housing. And as is said, I think the government says in the, in the in the throne speech, and again, I, this is a quote, investments in critical infrastructure like housing have been chronically underfunded, and again, the, and that we cannot continue on this path. Absolutely, we cannot continue on this path. So when we say that investments in critical infrastructure, and we're talking here, in, in this case, about housing like housing, um, let's not forget that four, of the, the four years out of the last decade, this government was in power. You had the opportunity, you had the ability, you had the legislative authority to commit as much money as you wanted to public housing on this, in this province at a time of unprecedented need. And almost nothing was done. It's a shocking, I, I think we'll look back at the four years, I mean, of course, things like COVID and, and healthcare crises and, and the economic collapse of the, you know, in all kinds of ways and, and wars. But here on Prince Edward Island, I think that inability or that lack of desire, whatever it was from this government, to see that a housing crisis was right before us and do nothing within their power to alleviate that is just, it's a shocking, shocking thing. Other jurisdictions very close to us, Nova Scotia, for example, access the Rapid Housing Initiative. Funding from the federal government, significant funding from the federal government. Um, and, and as the name suggests, Rapid Housing Initiative, the federal government recognized that this was a crisis that required immediate attention. And yet, 
our provincial government did not even put in an application for funds. It's something that could have been done in partnership with, with uh, non-governmental organizations, and in, to a certain extent that happened through indigenous organizations here. But the government itself did not put in an application for rapid housing initiative funds from the federal government for in the entire four years. In Nova Scotia, they, built, they bought motels and they converted them into apartments for people who needed public housing. That's the sort of thing that we should have been doing. And, and it's one thing to look back and say we should have done and, and, and how that has contributed to the crisis, the housing crisis that we have. But the crisis has not gone away. In fact, the crisis is getting worse. We see the number of housing starts here on Prince Edward Island far, far below what we need, even to maintain the very challenging level of accessibility and affordability that we have for housing here. We know that we're going to need to build 2,000 new units per year just to keep up with the population growth that, that we are projecting over the next few years. That means about 500 new units per quarter have to be built here on Prince Edward Island. You know the number of starts in the last quarter here on PEI? 130 something, like not even close. So at a time when we need to be with all the vigor that we have and the government seized by this, committed to this, putting all kinds of funding in it and our platform dedicated almost half a billion dollars of public funding over the next five years had we formed government. There was no matching commitment from the government that sits across from me now. I really hope that that, again, is not indicative of a government that does not care about the thousands of islanders who are living in housing insecurity, the hundreds of islanders who are homeless, and all of those who are finding it a struggle to meet their rent or their mortgage payments as interest rates rise every single month. This government needs to be far more involved in this, in this situation this government needs to be far more committed to islanders and to what is a basic human right, which is to have a roof over your head. I think I talked a little bit about Housing First the other day. And back in 2019, the year that this government took office, the, at that time, official opposition Green Caucus brought, wrote a white paper on the housing crisis which lay before us. So that, this was just a few months after we became elected as official opposition. We wrote a substantial white paper which outlined all of the prospective challenges that lay before this province if we did not do certain things. And guess what? Four years later, we are exactly in the housing crisis that could have been foresaw, foreseen by any government back then. But we saw no action from this government. Again, I hope not reflective of, of a government that doesn't care or doesn't understand. But after four years of inaction and of thumb twiddling and of, of not getting the job done on critical files, my confidence in this premier and this government to get the essential work for the well-being of islanders done is severely eroded. Another issue which for the last four years has not moved forward one tiny millimeter is land use planning. We know that for decades now, uh, successive governments have received advice on what we should do in terms of creating a land use plan from tip to tip. And again, I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, so I'm not going to dwell on this. And I also mentioned yesterday that I'm heartened and um, I'm feeling a little bit optimistic about the rearrangement of the departments and, and the way things are now. And again, a new minister in leadership in that file. And I, I really, really hope that this government, again, um, I hope the last four years of inaction, of silence on this issue, of dithering, of no substantive movement at all when it comes to instituting a, a land use plan. I hope that's not indicative of a government, again, that doesn't care, a government that doesn't accept its responsibilities, a government that doesn't understand that inaction on some files is 
often the most damaging thing that you can do. We talk about what governments can do, and, 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 and sometimes governments make mistakes, and that's fine. I, I mean, governing is difficult. Governing is extremely difficult, and I fully ex accept that. Um, and, the, and that government will make mistakes in, in decisions, in policies, in legislation that they bring forward, in budgetary decisions that they make. But inaction can be an even greater mistake. And I think we're seeing here a government, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's on housing, whether it's on the topic I'm talking about right now, which is a lack of movement on land use planning and care of our environment, care of our communities, care of our municipalities, care of farmland, for goodness sake, um, that we have a, a government, I hope that that's not indicative, again, of a government that doesn't care or doesn't understand the seriousness of the problems that lie before us. I'm going to talk a little bit about Point de Roche here because it's perhaps emblematic of a government that has allowed people, many people, many of our neighbours, particularly here in Charlottetown, but this is across the province, unhoused people to end up living in tents at a time when this government granted permits for a construction project which clearly violates, and we now have FOIC documents which support this, clearly violate two acts. The Planning Act and the Environmental Protection Act. And I know the Premier sat in this, stood rather in this house in the last session, uh, the fall session of the previous assembly, and said, if there's evidence that any law has been broken, I will pull the permits for this project in a minute. That's what he said, in a minute. And of course, the project goes ahead. At that time, we didn't have the evidence that laws had been broken. Now we do. And I look forward to the Premier's explanation of why he has not pulled the permits for this project in the minute that he promised that he would. The issue with Point de Roche is not just that somebody from away with endless amounts of money has dumped thousands of tons of armour rock on a public beach blocking access and is building a 10,000 square foot mansion under a grandfathering clause for a property that was, no, that was about 10th that size. That's a problem, of course it is. There's all kinds of problems related to that. The fact they're building in a buffer zone and the, and the fact that the setbacks are not there and the fact that where we measure the, uh, the normal high tide line um, is changed. It's all sorts of issues with this particular project, but for me it's emblematic. The bigger problem is it's emblematic of a government that is willing to allow that sort of development to go ahead, development that we know is, is just, it doesn't fit. I mean, that's perhaps the best way I can put it. It doesn't fit in terms of our environmental sensibilities. It doesn't fit in what we know about climate change and what this is going to do to our shorelines. It doesn't fit in the community. There are no other places on Prince Edward Island that look like that. It doesn't fit with what we know a cottage to be. It's not that at all. It, it, it doesn't, there's nothing about it fits. And it also doesn't fit within our legislation and our regulations. And that, there are so many things about this which scream this is an issue, an, an area of governance that absolutely demands to be updated and it has to be done now. And we've had 50 years of reports telling us that we need to tighten up our land use planning. And we've had, again, successive administrations who've done absolutely nothing on that issue. And I call on this minister to bring forward, in the time of this government's mandate, a comprehensive land use plan, including shoreline protection through the lens of climate change, as they have done in Nova Scotia with their Climate Protection Act, I'm sorry, with their, their Shoreline Protection Act, that we do that here on Prince Edward Island and that we do it in a timely manner because climate change is not slowing down, it's speeding up. The throne speech says, and again I quote, how we use our land is an important topic that islanders want to discuss and be a part of. Now, I, I, I agree with that. Islanders do want to be a part of this, and I'm quite sure that there will be extensive public consultation as we go through the process of developing a land use plan over the next couple of years. But for 50 years we've talked about this, 
And I think far more than wanting to discuss it, I think islanders want a government that will take action on this, finally, after five decades of inaction. They've been waiting for so long for a government to have the courage and the foresight to actually do what we all know is required. And of course, there are challenges. I get that. Um, but I have faith in this minister. It's something we've already discussed. It's something I'm quite sure that we will continue to discuss over the next little while. Um, so I do have faith in this government and in this minister to turn this around. But if I don't get clear indications over the next little while that this land use plan is something which is a priority and will be coming forward over the next couple of years, as was stated in their platform, then I will not be so um, I will not be so generous in my remarks here in this House. The speech from the throne also noted that, that a new land use plan will help support our agricultural sector, primarily through ensuring agricultural land stays in agricultural production. This is critical. We know that we're losing 39 acres of agricultural land on average every single day. 39 acres of prime agricultural land here on Prince Edward Island, the food island, the, the million acre farm. We're losing 39 acres a day. That's 14,000 acres a year. That's 60,000 acres of farmland has been lost under this government's watch. 60,000 acres over the last four and some years of farmland gone and gone forever. That is a disgrace and it's a disservice to islanders today and it's a terrible disservice to future islanders, to our children and their grandchildren who are, we don't have huge resources here on Prince Edward Island, but my goodness, what we have is beautiful farmland and we're giving it away. We're not protecting it. So when the throne speech says that that we will support our agricultural sector primarily through ensuring agricultural land stays and agricultural production, then for goodness sake do it. You had four years to do something about this and you did nothing. There's another example of government failing to acknowledge its own role, failing to acknowledge the criticality of this issue and failing to acknowledge that the agricultural sector here, which you have supported, I will grant you that in many other ways, without land, the agricultural sector is nothing. And we have to support our agriculture first and foremost in absolutely maintaining every single acre of arable agricultural land that we have here on Prince Edward Island. And this government has failed miserably in doing that. Moving on to the economy, we're you know, obviously happy to see the, the economic growth that we've seen here on Prince Edward Island, unprecedented growth here. In large part, I should say, uh, boosted by the uh, population strategy that we have. I mean, one sure way of, of increasing your economic activity is to bring more people into your economy. And we have done that at a rate faster than any other jurisdiction in Canada for a very long time now and continue to do so. So let's celebrate the economic successes that we have had. But let's not forget, as my honourable friend uh, suggested in her remarks earlier this afternoon, that with this increased population and the economic juicing that it brings, the boost that it brings to our economy here, that it puts pressures on some critical services, whether that's healthcare, housing, childcare, transportation infrastructure, um, land. There's all kinds of ways that an increasing population, while it is great for the economy, and, and, and of course, we have to understand that, that that is a good thing, that our economy has remained strong in this time, a great challenge for economies all around the globe. But are we doing this with also a view to the challenges and the resources that government has to consequently invest in infrastructure to support this new population? And so far, I have not seen, well, the evidence would suggest no, because we have a housing crisis, Supply and demand is so out of whack here. We have one of the lowest vacancy rates in the country. Healthcare, of course, we all know how far the patient registry, how much that has grown over the last few years, almost exactly in parallel to the number of, I think the minister mentioned that earlier today in her ministerial statement. Um, in housing, in healthcare, transportation infrastructure, I mean, it's, uh, 
Sometimes it's pretty hard getting around Charlottetown. It's not so bad out in District 17. We haven't, uh, there are not too, not too many traffic jams out there. But getting around, getting around Charlottetown, even Summerside on occasion, could be, you know, the, there are it, noticeably more people around. Wonderful. This is great in so many ways. But if we don't build the infrastructure to ensure that these people are housed properly, are cared for with our healthcare system properly, can actually move comfortably around our island safely and properly, then we're not doing well. So one of the things that was in the throne speech was support for community organizations. And, and I welcome that. And I, I applaud the government for continuing with that, because these community organizations do fantastic work. We, um, those of us who were present today, and I, I, I know several of the ministers across were present today for the, the walk in silence. Um, that's just one community group who, who organized that, Daniel Mali. I mean, a wonderful, a wonderful community group, well supported by this government. And she actually made mention of that. And there were a couple of announcements today. I won't talk about that because I know they're budgetary and, and, and we will wait. But a couple of very encouraging announcements in, in terms of that particular community organization. But very often, where there are gaps in government services, and there are many here on Prince Edward Island. We rely on community organizations to step up and fill those gaps, whether they're, again, in healthcare, in mental health, um, in community organizations. There's all kinds of places where we rely on volunteer organizations or non-governmental organizations to fill those gaps in the social safety net and, and in our communities. And often they have to beg and scrounge and plead for, for funding from one year to the next. They spend a lot of their time writing funding approved. Uh, and those of us who've worked or volunteered in, in community organizations are fully aware of that. Instead of delivering the services and providing what they want to do, they spend far too much of their time um, writing applications from one year to the next just to secure that funding for the following year. So I'm really glad to see that this government is going to provide more stable, long-term, appropriate funding core funding, operational funding for these organizations that do such critical work in our, in our um, communities and across our province. The government also announced uh, a number of tax measures in its speech, um, increasing the personal exemption, for example, to $15,000 over the next four years. With every $1,000 increase in the basic exemption. And, and for many people, that might sound like an undiluted good thing, particularly for low-income islanders. That's not necessarily true. Every $1,000 that we increase the basic exemption, and that's the level before which people get taxed, it benefits people who are in higher income brackets more than it does those who, who are in lower income tax brackets, because the, it's, a, it's a progressive tax system. It costs the Treasury about $9 million for every $1,000 that we increase the basic exemption. So what this government is saying is that they are going to increase this regressive taxation policy, which again on the surface sounds good, but which actually benefits those who can most afford to pay taxes in our community. And it's going to cost the Treasury $9 million. That's $9 million that we could use on programs, targeted programs, where we feel they are more needed. A far better approach would be to have a refundable tax credit, like the Federal Workers Tax Credit, that is specifically targeted for people of low income. The Federal Tax Credit, the Workers Tax Credit, is for workers under $35,000. And it provides hundreds of dollars of relief to those people, targeted specifically to that group. Not the people who are making 100,000, not the people who are making $200,000, but only and specifically to this lower group. We could mirror that, or we could have a provincial um, tax, uh, refundable tax credit that would work in harmony with the workers' tax credit that is a federal program, and, and work for those who are between 35 and $50,000, for example, which is what our platform had suggested. We used to think that people who were struggling economically on Prince Edward Island were necessarily people in low incomes. That's not true. There are people, two-income households, who have good jobs, full-time jobs, 
who are really struggling to meet their monthly demands, their monthly expenses. And $50,000 is not a lot of money to raise a family on here on Prince Edward Island, or even to, to live as, as a single person in some circumstances, depending on what your, what your expenses are. And this targeted refundable tax credit could help the people who need that help most. So I really hope, I'm delighted that the Minister of Finance is taking notes as I'm speaking here, and I hope that she's, she will look into the prospect of not, con, not following through on that promise of raising the basic exemption, because it really is not a progressive tax system, it's not a progressive tax measure. And I can send you all kinds of documentation to support that. Rather, let's have, ta let's have targeted tax relief for those who need it most. Uh, we know also that the province is facing um, a, a really severe major labour shortage uh, you know, across the whole economy. This is, we, we see it um, in the service economy, we see it in healthcare, we see it in construction, we see it everywhere, and, and it's not particular or unique to our province, this is something that's, that's everywhere. And one thing that we have to do as a province, or any jurisdiction has to do, is that we have to be competitive when it comes to not just attracting business. We talk a lot about you know, being competitive, we need to have um, lower, lower tax rates to make sure that the, the businesses are going to come to Prince Edward Island and establish themselves here. And there's a, there's a certain logic to that, I, I get that. But equally, we have to be competitive when it comes to attracting workers. And as I said yesterday at some point, you know, we, we prided ourselves on being a place where it was, it was relatively inexpensive to live, and that's not true anymore. But we're not offering wages which are going to attract people to come here. People used to come here and buy houses far, far more cheaply than they could in other parts of the country. And that's less and less true. So I think we need to look after our workers better, not just in terms of wages, but we need to, we need to make sure that they come here and, and find good working conditions. And, and one of the ways that we do that is through our, our legislation, the Employment Standards Act, and, and we know that government has a role to play in that by making sure that all islanders, regardless of what sector you work in, enjoy good working conditions. That's why we have the Employment Standards Act. And although a review of the Employment Standards Act was announced <coughs> years ago, there's, again, like mental health, like long-term care, like a, a land use plan within, within the next four years, that's not mentioned in the throne speech. There's nothing in there to indicate that this government is actually going to move ahead with this critical review um, and put in recommendations for changes to a Employment Standards Act, something which is really desperately needed in this province. Again, if we want to be competitive in attracting people to come to Prince, Prince Edward Island to stay and live and work, we need to make sure that their working conditions are at least as attractive as they are in, in other jurisdictions. I have to ask about paid sick leave. You know, we had a we had a vigorous debate in the last session, the last uh, assembly of this house, on whether paid sick leave paid sick leave is something that we we should institute here on Prince Edward Island. Unfortunately, the house voted no for any paid sick leave. Now we used to have a special leave fund, but of course that's ended with us no, no longer being in um, a health emergency. And so we're left with no support whatsoever for paid sick leave. And our, again, our province is far behind other jurisdictions when it comes to legislating what, is, what are minimum standards of paid sick leave. That's just one of many areas where workers' rights are not up to date here in this province. So I really, really hope that we are going to see this review of the Employment Standards Act come forward and that this government will actually move ahead with it and that we will see the fruits of that, of that review. The diversity and inclusion on our island. Um, we had some lovely words spoken today um, ab about, trans about the, the day, International Day against homophobia, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. And with one element, one aspect <coughs> of uh, a lack of inclusiveness and a lack of safety that some of our community members feel here on Prince Edward Island. And again, I'm, I support this government's uh, initiatives, which, which they have brought forward to make this island a, a more supportive, more inclusive place. 
Um, I think it's really critical that we continue to do that work, that we continue to support the BIPOC community, um, the Black Cultural Society, BIPOC Usher, all of our indigenous uh, members. And it was lovely just the other week to be present for the, uh, the event commemorating the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and two-spirited people uh, in Victoria Park where for, the, for perhaps the first time, and I'm not sure about that, but it's a rare thing, where all five indigenous organizations here on Prince Edward Island came together to organize the event and to celebrate, not celebrate, to commemorate that, that dark, that dark uh, subject. And so it was lovely to see them all there together. And Kateri Code, for those who were at the Walk in Silence today, spoke beautifully um, about the needs of the indigenous people when it comes to violence family violence. So there's a lot that we can and should do uh, in terms of making this province even more inclusive, even more welcoming to the diversity that is in our community, increasingly in our community. And that's one of the beautiful things that comes from our population growth strategy is that the diversity of this island has just absolutely blossomed over the last few years. And it's so lovely to see um, people of different faiths, people of different colors, people who worship different religions, living together and learning to live together. And that's not an easy thing to do sometimes. And government absolutely has a role to play. And all of us in this room have a role as leaders in our community to be role models in how we are not just accepting, not just tolerating, but supportive and embracing and uplifting of all members of our community. And we don't always get that right. So I was glad to hear the words of my colleague earlier today about, she talked about um, love and unity. And I think we do pretty well here on Prince Edward Island, but clearly you see you see examples of intolerance. You see examples where people, for whatever reason, um, do not embrace and welcome and support newcomers to our island or people who may look or sound differently to them. So we have work to do. And particularly those of us in, in this legislature have work to do in terms of being role models. And that's going to mean from a government point of view, making sure that funding to these organizations remains there and allowing these communities to decide what the best use of that funding is. Um, we need to support our indigenous community, particularly here on Prince Edward Island, when it comes to land acquisitions, because the, the Mi'kmaq people here on Prince Edward Island have the, some of the smallest land holdings of, of any nation, any indigenous nation across Canada. We have very tiny reserves here. We have, um, and of course, this is unceded territory. Um, it has never been surrendered. It has never been ceded. And we have a lot of very complicated, difficult decisions and, and conversations to be had, both within the settler community and between the settler community and our indigenous <coughs> friends, to make sure that the realities, and we see this across our, our whole country, the idea of reconciliation and, and in the many forms that that takes, but here particularly when it comes to land acquisition and, and land back, we should be leading the country in that for a number of reasons. We're the, the fact that we have one indigenous nation here on Prince Edward Island, where some other provinces have literally hundreds of indigenous nations to, um, to negotiate with. And the fact that the Mi'kmaq people here have the, some of the smallest lo land holdings in the country, it's something that should spur us into action and to be um, a, a, a leader in the country. Um, I, do, I, I do appreciate the work that has been done. I think the relations that we have here between the indigenous community and government is very strong and very positive. And I think we have to continue that work to make sure that that stays in place. Um, there is a, a bill that was introduced in the last uh, assembly um, on, environment, on in, an environmental bill of rights, which requires to be brought back to this house. Very important piece of legislation, a piece of legislation um, which was supported by the indigenous community, 
and somehow got stalled towards the end of the last session of this legislature. And I really hope that, that we have an opportunity to bring that back. I also hope that we mimic British Columbia in bringing forward uh, a bill related to, related to UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So far, BC is the only province that has brought forward and passed a piece of provincial legislation related to that, the, that United Nations Declaration. And I really hope that we are the next province to do, to do that. Another area here on Prince Edward Island where I think we can be leaders, and that's some of the excitement about being a small province, um, is that you can, you can be bold. You can make bold legislative decisions. I, I, I appreciated the questions from the member from Borden Kinkora this morning on could we be the first province? Uh, regarding the, the gas tanks and, and not issuing new permits for that. That is a really progressive, innovative idea. And we know that people who are putting money into, into fossil fuel... Yeah. Just the idea that, I mean, it just makes perfect economic sense. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to have to hammer the oil and gas industries to stop making investments in things like this, because they can see the writing on the wall that, you know, very soon in the, in the future, I mean, we're going to stop building uh, internal combustion engines. So, of course, we're going to have less of a need for these infrastructures. So why don't we be the first province to come forward and stop issuing new licenses? We have plenty of gas stations here on Prince Edward Island. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So let's be innovative. I mean, that's just one small example, but it's, but it's great. I really appreciated you bringing that up today. Uh, I bring that up now because an another thing which no other province has done is to expand the voting rights to permanent residents. If we want to feel the new island, if we want to make the new islanders who move here feel welcome, feel part of the community, feel that their voices are respected and heard, why don't we give them voting rights in municipal elections? and in school board elections. There's a question as to whether it would require um, a charter change in order to make them able to vote, make new islanders give them the right to vote in provincial elections. We could do that. It may generate a charter challenge, but it's something that I would like this legislature to consider. I absolutely think that we can easily consider <coughs> granting voting rights for permanent residents here on Prince Edward Island in municipal and school board elections, that's something we have complete authority and jurisdiction over. Why don't we do that? It would empower these people to, to have, feel that their voices are heard. To, yeah, uh, let's, let's do that. But we could be even bolder. We could be the first province to allow permanent <coughs> residents to vote in a provincial election. Again, a signal to the new islanders who come here that they are, that we embrace them, that we value you, that we want to hear your voice, that we, we, we will grant you the opportunity to be a part of choosing your next government. I'll tell you now, the voter turnout that you would see in that community would be a heck of a lot better than the 60 whatever percent it was that we got in the last election here. They would be in, so enthused by having an opportunity to do that. But let, you know, I, I will accept for the meantime voting um, in municipal and school board elections, and let's do that. Let's be the province that does that. Let's, let's be a country leader. Let's be a national leader in that. When it comes to the anti-racism racism strategy, PEI, of course, is not immune to racism. We see examples of that, sadly, all of the time. And over the past few years, though, we've seen so many reports of very ugly racism here on Prince Edward Island, and I, I suspect we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg because that's only the things that, that get reported. And if we want a truly inclusive island, we have to plan for that. We have to, we have to work towards that. And that, I believe, starts with education. I think it, it starts with educating ourselves. I think it starts with educating our kids in schools. And many members in this house have spoken eloquently about the importance to talk about this in our schools to make sure that the, the new islanders who come here 
are welcomed and embraced and supported and given absolutely the same sorts of level of respect that every other islander has. So I think it starts with education. I think we need to call out racism wherever we see it. All of us in this house have to do that. We all have a responsibility. And we have to make sure that our politicians and, and that our, our legislation is there and, the, and, and that it, it supports anti-racism here on, on people uh, on Prince Edward Island and, and, and that it absolutely does not negatively impact people of colour here on Prince Edward Island. We have lots of work to do in this area and I want to specifically re reach out to my colleague next door here um, who's done fantastic work with the BIPOC community here on Prince Edward Island but we all need to join him in doing that. We all need to be allies in the work that needs to be done to make Prince Edward Island a truly inclusive place where racism, racism is not acceptable in any form at any time. One of the areas where community organizations play an enormous role in supporting um, inclusivity and diversity here on Prince Edward Island is in our 2SLGBTQIA plus community. We have some fantastic community partners. We have Pride PEI, we have the Transgender Network, we have so many good people who have worked extraordinarily hard to make Prince Edward Island a leader when it comes to um, when it comes to, again, embracing, supporting, loving people in our community who are, who are homosexual, who are gay, who are lesbian, who are transgendered, who are, who, who are different from us. It's not okay to say that when somebody from the queer community is just being themselves, just living their lives, that they are somehow forcing it down people's throats. That's not okay to say that. We in this house have to be incredibly careful about the words we use. We have to be supportive at all times. We have to be leaders. We have to lead by example. And that means supporting every single person in our community, regardless of their gender, regardless of who they worship, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their economic status. We need to make Prince Edward Island the safest, securest, most welcoming, loving, unified place that we possibly can. And again, we don't always do a good job of that. A throne speech is traditionally a place where governments you know, get to introduce grand plans and, and hopefully transformational ideas and inspiring visions. But apparently not this one. I've spoken at length now about where I feel there are severe deficiencies in this throne speech when it comes to being that document that inspires islanders with confidence in this government to tackle the challenges of our day. Instead, islanders have sort of been delivered mostly repackaged ideas from before that in many respects this government has failed utterly to deliver in their first four years, the first four years of their mandate. It's difficult to have faith in a government or to be confident in a government to get things done when for the first four years of their administration, they failed to deliver on so many critical files. It was a government that in many respects felt from this vantage point that it didn't really know where it was going. And if you don't know where you're going, how can you possibly lead? You have to have a vision. You have to have an idea of where you want to go. And by the way, Another thing missing from the throne speech, besides any mention of long-term care, almost any mention of mental health, is the word vision. The, the word vision does not appear in this throne speech. Perspective is in there. 
But perspective for me is very much more looking at things from a different angle, from a sideways point of view. It's not looking forward. Perspective is not looking forward. Perspective is gathering information. And I don't know, it's, it's certainly not vision. It's not synonymous with vision. So after four years of stumbling, four years of fumbling, four years of scrambling, four years of inaction, four, four years of dithering, we have a throne speech that does not even include the word vision. That would really concern me if I was sitting on the government side. Because without vision, we are not leading a province to an inspiring place. You cannot govern if you don't have a vision of where you want to go. And I find it shocking, again, that that word does not even appear once in this speech. So this government doesn't appear to know what it wants to do and, and other than maintain the status quo. And that is not good enough. We've had four years of not even maintaining the status quo because access to health care is worse, the housing situation is worse, our environmental situation is worse. In so many ways, the childcare situation is worse. There are so many things that have gotten worse. Oh, it is worse. Minister, the number of, uh, the number of people waiting for childcare spaces has increased substantially over the last few years. I know we've created more spaces. I know there's more funding there in the budget, and I'm looking forward to seeing the $20 million come forward, or at least the commitment to that in the, in the throne speech and in the platform. But we have thousands, no, yes, we have thousands of island families waiting for childcare spaces, and that's not acceptable. I know this is, again, a problem across the country. I get that. I understand that. But here on PEI, with all of the things that we have, we, it, because of its effect on, on families, on children, on our communities, on our economy, it's something that we really need to figure out. And again, there are, it's a complex thing, and I don't doubt that, Minister. I, I'm not suggesting that this is a simple fix. And I'm glad, after imploring you for two years now to create a fund for daycare centres in order that they don't have to close because they can't afford their capital expenses, that we seem to have a fund in place that's going to allow that to happen. Now, that's one part of the puzzle. There are other parts as well. But this is a government that just simply doesn't seem to know what it wants to do. And that's really alarming. And what's clear to me? The hour has been called. Honourable Member, would you like to adjourn debate? And have I will here? adjourn debate, seconded by the Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> member from Kensington, Malpeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, second by the member from Rusty o Emerald, uh, that this House adjourn until Wednesday, May 18th at Thursday. Thursday May 18th at 1 p.m. Shall I carry? Enjoy your evening, everyone.